Hello, welcome. Uh, today we have the webinar on hot topics on infection in critical care. My name is Destina Kuledi. I work in critical care department at Econ Hospital and I'm also affiliated with the University of Queensland. Infection represent a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the intensive care units, especially in our era of multi-drug resistance. In the COVID era, we have uh, uh, seen a very uh, high uh, increasing, a very important increasing prevalence of uh, ICU infection as well. Uh, it's very important to have prompt diagnosis, correct uh, treatment in uh, optimized doses, and also uh, to have uh, uh, antimicrobial stewardship in place in order to improve outcomes and uh, decrease uh, antimicrobial resistant development. Today, uh, we have uh, uh, leading experts uh, in the field of uh, critical care infection that uh, they have joined the webinar and we thank, thank them because uh, we know that the, their schedule is overloaded and they're gonna update us uh, in trending uh, issues in ICU infections. Uh, we are starting with uh, Professor Torres, Anthony Torres from uh, the University of Barcelona. We welcome Professor Torres. Okay, hello to everyone. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to recording in progress. Uh, this uh, symposium uh, organized by the Isaac's infections in the Equine Sepsis Working Group. I'm going to cover the management of severe CAP. And my name is Anthony Torres. I am professor of pulmonology and respiratory intensive care at University of Barcelona Hospital Clinic in Barcelona. So the mortality of severe committed pneumonia is an acceptably high with figures that can reach up to 38% when these patients need mechanical ventilation and shock, as uh, showed in this publication from our group. It is very similar from that published in CHESS in 2020 about uh, data in Kentucky and United States of America. Interestingly, in that uh, study, the uh, one-year mortality uh, reached uh, almost 50%. So for my talk today, I am going to use two documents. Uh, one is the guidelines of the IDSA, ATSA societies published in 2019. Uh, the first author was uh, uh, Professor Medley. And the other one is an international perspective of these, not, these new guidelines, uh, which is in, in, in fact an appraisal of the, of the guidelines published in 2018 by several and the opinion was, was given by several experts. Today, I'm going to give uh, insights about diagnosis, biomarkers, stratification for severity, antibiotic treatment, and coadjuvant treatments. Well, there is not a lot of data about the microbial etiology specifically of SCAP. And in this paper in 2018, from our group, we can see the strep pneumo is the first a microbe isolated, but there are cases of Legionella pneumonia, respiratory viruses that probably are more frequent than we thought, uh, some staph aureus and some Pseudomonas aeruginosa, some Enterobacteria CI. And finally, very importantly, the polymicrobial cause uh, is important because uh, these patients have a higher mortality. Uh, you can see in the columns the non-invasive mechanical ventilated patients and the invasive mechanically ventilated patients. Let's just start with uh, molecular diagnosis. This is not clearly recommended in the guidelines. And uh, uh, the problem of this is that not <clears throat> all hospitals have this technique, but in the last years, these molecular diagnostics, especially in the framework of COVID, have been implemented. The guidelines say that uh, for some microorganisms could be very important, such as, for example, MRSA or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So the recommendation is still unclear, but I think that we will end with these techniques implemented in the clinical practice. <clears throat> 
What about procalcitonin to guide initial antibiotic therapy? Uh, the recommendation was against the use of procalcitonin to determine the need for initial antibiotic therapy. And uh, what they argued, argued the spurs is that uh, uh, procalcitonin was not enough sensitive to withhold antibiotics in these patients, particularly with severe cut. And for example, in this uh, study from the group of Dan Marshall, you can see that the sensitivity, depending on the cutoff point and depending on the po population studied, is not uh, enough, as I said, to withhold antibiotics in the population. Another problem is that the dynamics of procalcitonin, you can see here that uh, if you uh, stratify patients according that less than three days or more than three days of symptoms, <clears throat> procalcitonin decreases after three days, and then you can have an invalid perception about uh, the differentiation between bacterial and viral infections. What about the stratification of severity? Well, we have the classical prognostic scores such as pneumonia severity index and CURP 65 or CRB 65. There are not uh, uh, scores that uh, use it for the to, to admit patients in the ICU. And for that reason, the guideline recommended uh, the ATSA, IDSA guidelines uh, divided in the major criteria, need of mechanical ventilation or shock, and the minor three out of the nine minor criteria, and perhaps other that could be useful. This is the table in you. You can see the major and the minor criteria. If you look at here, one important of importance about a uh, clarification about that is that multi-lower infiltrates can be unilateral or, or uh, bilateral because it's two or more. So in this study from our group, we showed that the bilateral is significantly, bilateral multilobar significantly associated with an increased risk of mortality. Lymph lymphocytes that now have uh, a lot of importance in COVID uh, were studied by us in community quarantine pneumonia in this paper in 2017. And we uh, confirmed in two populations that the, the figure of 724 lymphocytes per millimeter of mercury increased uh, less than that, uh, to fall mortality risk. And so perhaps this parameter could be included in the minor criteria in the future. What about the treatment? Uh, the treatment for severe cap in the guidelines is the combination of a beta lactam plus a macrolide, a strong recommendation, moderate quality of evidence, or a beta lactam plus a respiratory fluid quinoline, a strong recommendation, but with low quality of evidence. What is new now in that recommendations is the list of uh, beta-lactams, antibiotics. Intra intravenous cefuroxin has been removed and then ceftaroline has been added. And the reason of that is that it shows superiority clinical outcomes compared to keftriaxone in cap caused by strep pneumo and methicillin sensitive staphylococcus. In case of pseudomonal risk factors and the coverage, they recommend one, only one antisemonal uh, beta lactam, and this is in contrast um, or in comparison to the last guidelines that they recommended two antibiotics. You can see here that uh, combination of therapy with a macrolide, and this is the last information that we have. An observational study that happened is that the combination therapy of macrolide uh, was. Uh, uh, really uh, associated with uh, uh, a better prognosis compared to other anti antibiotics or combination of antibiotics. And which macrolide? This is data from uh, uh, Evangelos uh, Jamarelos Burgulis, and you can see that they compare clarithromycin to azithromycin in combination or not, and they could observe that the uh, survival a survival benefit in patients that receive clarithromycin plus avitalactam compared to azithromycin plus avitalactam. The reasons for that are unclear, but uh, I have to say that clarithromycin is not uh, in every place available, and a lot of countries only have azithromycin. Keftarolin fosamine is a, a new, well, a relatively new cephalosporine, cephalosporine uh, when uh, excellent in vitro activity against the uh, 
uh, clinically relevant gram positive and gram negative bacteria, including MRSA. And uh, it has been studied in, in two uh, regulatory randomized trials and in another uh, randomized trial. You can see these trials here. The focus one and the focus two were the regulatory trials, while the Asia Cup was performed later. The reason of that is that they used two grains of KEF3 action instead of one. And as you can see in this study, and in one of the focus, they found superiority in clinical cure uh, when comparing KEF, uh, KEF tyrol into uh, KEF3 action. And this is a, a a bullet analysis of all these studies, focus one, focus two, and the shakat. And in the majority of the populations, you can see here that there was a superiority in clinical cure in favor of uh, keftarolin, uh, 600 milligrams every 12 hours. This is a real world study that uh, uh, we, we published with um, Matteo Bassetti in the 2020, and you see that the only independent predictor of clinical failure in a patient with severe CAP was the time elapsing from diagnosis to keftarolin therapy. And I think this is important because probably keftarolin should be one of the first antibiotics empirically given to patients with test cap. There are other changes, for example, in case of uh, um, aspiration pneumonia, guidelines do not recommend anaerobic coverage because this the role of anaerobes is not clear now, and uh, this uh, anaerobic coverage might cause harm without added benefit. But my question here, is there a subset of aspiration pneumonia in whom anti-anaerobe antibiotic could be useful? For example, in case of empyema, uh, pulmonary abscess, etc. cetera. Uh, what about uh, this small subset of population uh, that cause uh, severe cap uh, uh, and uh, this is most said the theology is pseudomonas aeruginosa, other multi resistant and methicillin resistant staph hours. The guideline recommended the use of uh, scores to predict the risk factors locally validated. And uh, which are the resistance of CAP pathogens with potential clinical implications? There is a summary here extreme pneumo resistant to macrolides. Mycoplasma pneumonia resistant to macrolides, resistances of hemophilus influenza to penicillins, and as I said, the resistance of pseudomonas, ESBL enterobacterales, and methicillin resistant staphylococcus. And this is called PES score. We published this score in 2017 and 2014, and now we have validated this score very recently in several populations, including Severcap. And you can see here a very easy to uh, uh, measure variables that when the score is higher, equal or higher than five, uh, the sensitivity is uh, higher than, than, than 70%. Uh, another, another changes or another recommendation is that the new guideline recommends against the routine corticosteroid used for clinical acquired pneumonia. We will cover this later on. They do not recommend withholding empirical antibiotic therapy and severe influenza cap but in some patients with a PCR positive for influenza and without isolation for bacteria can be uh, considered the withdrawing antibiotics. And uh, probably we can extrapolate the recommendation to COVID, but we need uh, more studies on that. Well, uh, and about corticosteroids, the second uh, paper that I use it, this paper uh, written by uh, experts, they said that uh, uh, they advise against the routine using community acquired pneumonia. But let's see what the evidence says. For example, the last meta analysis, this is the last meta analysis published in CNAG. And for severe pneumonia, these are the studies. You can see a clear decrease in uh, uh, the, of the mortality of the severe cap compared to non esteroids. In uh, which population? This is in important because there are some phenotypes that can be benefit more in terms of decreasing mortality. And this is a postdoc analysis of the samples obtained from one randomized trial. And they found that the population with a higher interleukin-6, a higher interleukin-8, and a higher level of MCP is the, is the target population to uh, give a uh, uh, esteroids because in this population there was a clear decrease to mortality compared to placebo. 
important, do not use it hydrocortisone. This is another meta-analysis from Juan, compare hydrocortisone to other uh, glucocorticosteroids, and they saw that uh, uh, giving hydrocortisone in patients with severe cap is not followed by a decreased mortality. And this is last information, still under revision, and I hope it will be uh, published soon. Uh, this is a multi-center study, uh, about 653 patients, and uh, with performance a propensity match at the score. And what uh, we could observe that in the population with uh, um, the two major criteria of one of the major criteria, there was a, a, a decrease in mortality when using corticosteroids. And probably here you can see the graph, uh, probably this is the population in which uh, we have to use corticoids when there is a high level of inflammation. Lessons learned about corticosteroids in COVID. Okay, first, guidelines can be wrong sometimes. Corticosteroids were not recommended in survival sepsis campaign document in April 2020. And for that reason, uh, they were not given at the beginning, but in, uh, in the front of a desperate situation, the physicians started to give anti, uh, corticosteroids. And now corticosteroids are now the standard of care in patients with respiratory failure or admitted to the ICU needing invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. This was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, again, thank you to the organizers for including me in this uh, very important program. Thank you, Professor. I would like to thank Professor Torres for the very interesting talk. Before I, we move on to the next speaker, I would like to uh, inform the audience that uh, you can send uh, your uh, questions uh, in the chat box. Please add your name and email. Uh, the answers won't be after the talks, but after uh, um, its a um, block of session is completed and at the end as well. If the speaker is unavailable, we're going to email the uh, answer to the email that you're going to provide. Our um, next speaker is Professor Jan de Waal, intensivist from uh, the University of uh, Ghent, and uh, going to discuss the uh, abdominal sepsis. Um, thank you, Jan, for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, talking to us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jan de Waal, and it's a pleasure to talk to you today on the topic of abdominal sepsis and managing patients with abdominal sepsis in the um, ICU primarily. Um, of course, 15 minutes is not a lot to discuss such a, a broad topic, but today I would like to share some insights from recent epidemiological studies including trends in microbiology, and briefly highlight the, um, the importance, the important role of uh, source control, um, as well as the, the, the new interventions, uh, percutaneous drainage, we do much, of, much more often now. And other than that, I would like also to briefly touch upon new antibiotics and aspects of antimicrobial use, all of this in the next 15, well, 14 minutes probably by now. So these are some um, disclosures that I want to share with you. Um, but let's move on. Abdominal infections, complicated intra-abdominal infections, I think remain one of the most challenging infections in, in the ICU. And compared to patients with other infections, patients with intra-abdominal infections typically develop multiple organ failure much more often, have a high risk of mortality, and often have a projected course in the ICU. Now, the management of these patients is, is challenging. And, and part of this is because of the um, 
the importance of source control. Source control is much more important here than in other, any other infection. And other than that, of course, the, uh, the issues related to selecting the right antimicrobial uh, therapy, changes in susceptibility, and multi-drug, uh, multi-drug resistance. Much of what we know in terms of epidemiology comes from these studies. This is the latest EPIC study, the EPIC-3 study from Jean-Louis Vincent, and it learns us that intra-abdominal infections actually rank second in terms of the frequency in the ICUs, but also um, they are associated with considerable morbidity and mortality. So we know more or less where they rank compared to other infections. Um, more detailed insights in specifically in intra-abdominal infections come from this a large multicenter uh, ESICM sponsored um, uh, study that was published a few years ago, uh, published by Stan Blot and many others, the abscess uh, uh, study. And what we've learned here, and, and a lot of uh, centers contributed to including more than 2,600 patients, is that the majority of patients still are patients with secondary and a little bit of tertiary peritonitis. Intradominal abscesses, of course, also um, uh, important. Uh, biliary tract infections, uh, in fact, um, also um, c- uh, accounting for a considerable number of infections, as you will see. Many of these infections, this is also important consideration, are in fact hospital-acquired uh, infections. Um, and in this study, the authors distinguished between early onset uh, intra-abdominal infections and late onset. Seven days was the cutoff here. Um, and what this actually, um, uh, these data showed us that indeed, uh, on the one side, the concept of late onset hospital acquired infections, that these were associated with the highest mortality uh, numbers, particularly so if we also add the uh, extent of uh, the infection as well. If you would compare localized versus diffuse peritonitis, you can see that patients with diffuse peritonitis having late onset intra-abdominal infections have actually the um, worst uh, outcomes. So this also transpired into the variables associated with mortality. You can see here that indeed the setting um, of late onset has the highest uh, uh, odds ratio for uh, mortality and the same holds true for diffuse versus localized or no anatomical barrier disruption. Um, other factors associated are the usual suspects, age, severity of disease, comorbidities, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but very striking, and again, very important, I'll touch briefly upon it later, is the importance of source control. If you fail to control the source of the infection, mortality goes up, and it even goes up considerably more if there's a continued signs of uh, inflammation as well. So definitely something to consider, to target uh, and to really make sure that the uh, source control is uh, adequate. Another important issue is, of course, um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. This is true in every infection we will be discussion, discussing uh, today. And there's numerous reasons why patients in the ICU are indeed uh, prone to developing these, um, these infections. But again, specifically in intra-abdominal infections, there are some specific conditions why this happens probably more um, uh, often. Um, these are the typical um, uh, factors associated with um, uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. Why is this important? Because antimicrobial resistance um, and use of antibiotics fuels this vicious uh, cycle. Uh, more empirical, broad-spectrum empirical treatment will in the end, again, lead to more uh, multi-resistant organisms. And don't forget, and I think it's very important to realize that here, source control is also a a specific contributor to that. Source control, or maybe better, the lack of source control. If you fail to control the source, if there's continued um, contamination of the peritoneal cavity, you will be using antimicrobials much more um, longer, of course, but failing to control the source of infection is definitely uh, one of the big contributors here in this story of antimicrobial resistance in complicated intra-abdominal infections. Another reason is that typically intra-abdominal infections are polymicrobial infections. So there's much more potential, so to speak, to have resistance developing in one of the contributing uh, pathogens. Of course, nosocomial infections are much more uh, associated with resistance and the big um, uh, ESBL producing enterobacterialis probably are the uh, biggest chunk of um, 
intradomal infections details these days. So I'll, I'll give you some details in a, in a minute. But don't forget, it's not limited to the gram-negative bacteria, also in enterococci and staphylococci, maybe not so often, but there's a potential for resistance development there uh, as well. And the same holds true probably for candida. As in any other infection, local ecology is very important. And this is nicely demonstrates. It's a very busy table, but this gives you the data from the abscess study I just mentioned. So 2,600 patients worldwide. You can look at different geographic um, reasons. This is the incidence of different bacteria. Let's, for instance, look at ESBL producing gram-negative bacteria. Overall, one out of six patients um, developed an infection with ESBL, but, but, but a lot of uh, variation, uh, geographical variation and in some parts of the world, up to 40% of patients uh, was actually diagnosed with ESBL. But it's not the only one. There's also carbapenem resistance, fluoroquinolone resistance, maybe not so uh, big of a problem of MRSA in these uh, patients. But um, the bottom line is that antimicrobial resistance in any form um, was detected in 26%, 26% of the patients, again, with a lot of um, um, regional variation. So antimicrobial resistance, definitely a problem now and a problem that will continue to challenge us in the, um, in the future. So let's um, change the topic now and, and move to uh, source control because what intra-abdominal infections, what makes it really different is the issue of source control. Often neglected, incompletely understood, and in, uh, adequately reported in, in a lot of research papers that I am um, I'm reading. There's some interesting trends and insights uh, in this topic that I would like to share today. Again, data coming from the uh, abscess study. Um, you can see here that um, this is in the, the flow chart of what treatments were given, what source control treatments were given to these patients. First of all, what is striking, of course, is that almost all of these patients required source control, not a big surprise, but remember, there's also patients with pancreatitis, biliary tract infections, et cetera, et cetera. So 95, uh, 96% uh, almost uh, required uh, an intervention. M much of this consisted of drainage and a lot of um, surgical drainage. So a lot of surgical interventions, percutaneous drainage was used, um, but maybe not as much as one would um, uh, expect. A very important consideration, and, and this is really something I would like to stress today, that source control is not always successful, despite what we may think uh, or what we may hear from the surgeon. In this study, roughly half of these uh, source control procedures in the end was successful. Um, a lot of them required another intervention and some actually, some a lot of patients still had persistent inflammation at day uh, seven. Another study that studied um, uh, the, the same issue is, is this one, recent study from uh, the Netherlands. It's a um, um, analysis of patients who were included in the MARS uh, studies. So looking at a, a different uh, aspect, but the same thing, about 25% of the procedures, source control procedures were um, uh, percutaneous uh, uh, drainage. Now, very strikingly is that a lot of patients, actually about half of them, required multiple interventions. What you can see here is the number of procedures that was necessary in patients who were either treated surgically or percutaneously. But you can see clearly that whether the surgical procedure or the um, uh, an, an percutaneous procedure was the first uh, uh, act, still a lot of them required multiple uh, interventions. And this also um, means, of course, that a lot of the uh, source control procedures were not um, successful initially. So roughly about 40% of patients had adequate source control by day 14. And um, another 30%, it was adequate, but multiple interventions were needed. But still, in one out of three patients, source control was not adequate. And the striking thing is that the immediate procedural adequacy, so the estimation of uh, whoever did the procedure or whoever was involved at that stage felt like, okay, this procedure was successful. It was almost 100%. So um, while we think it is successful at the start, in the end, roughly about one out of three patients in these two studies, similar findings, have inadequate source control. So think of this that many of the patients with abdominal infections, where you think the source is controlled, in the end, it will not be the case. So how to detect this? Also very interesting study, uh, data from the MARS study. They looked at 
C-reactive protein during the first seven days, white blood cell count, fever, no difference in between adequate, delayed adequate, or inadequate source control. So you can forget about these parameters. They're not useful. They will not help you to detect source control failure. What was helpful is persistence of multiple organist function. You can clearly see that patients who are improving actually have much more often adequate source control. And of course, this sounds logical, but nice example that um, um, uh, biomarkers will not always help you. Is source control, percutaneous source control, then always better? This study may suggest so. These uh, investigators looked at um, predictors of mortality in almost 700 patients out of uh, almost 3,000 patients who were treated with abdominal infections. Now, this suggests that there is a double mortality when an open procedure is done, but it's important to remember that these interventions were done in patients who already required a first surgical procedure. So this is about the second procedure, whether it was done open or percutaneously. So even after correcting for severity of the disease and a, num and a number of other uh, factors such as age, apparently there seems to be an increased mortality for open surgery. But I think there is a big risk of bias here because some um, complications are just not amenable to percutaneous drainage where others um, are. So that's definitely a bias to consider in these studies. In terms of surgical strategies, I think it's very clear by now, these are all data showing you that a planned relaparotomy approach is not a good thing. So in terms of surgical procedures, it is not necessary to go in um, every other day uh, to uh, clean the abdomen. But a very interesting approach I do want to briefly uh, touch upon is the potential of open abdomen treatment in patients with abdominal infections. So we do this a lot in patients with abdominal compartment syndrome um, or in trauma patients, but there are some arguments why also in intra-abdominal infection, this may be useful, better source control, prevention of abdominal compartment syndrome, recognizing early the complications that are present and maybe also modulating the inflammation. So definitely um, something to watch out for and maybe uh, something we will be doing more often in the future for the most severe infections, of course, uh, only. Before ending, um, briefly um, about biomarkers. You've, you've seen the data about biomarkers trying to, to um, detect failed source control. Also, diagnosing the infection is very challenging. And uh, these interesting data I just want to share with you uh, are coming from the, from the Netherlands looking at gene expression in blood leukocytes in patients with intra-abdominal infection and comparing them with post-op uh, patients. And indeed, uh, when you look at the um, areas under the ROC curve, you can see that this score based on gene expression in the leukocytes is much better than other scores, um, uh, other uh, transcriptomics uh, scores, but also much better compared to PCT, for instance, in diagnosing intra-abdominal uh, infection. So watch this space. A lot of interesting stuff will come out of this, I think. Briefly touching about new antibiotics because we will, we are uh, having new uh, treatment options uh, available now. I'm just listing those drugs that have now been um, licensed for the use in uh, complicated intra-abdominal infections. So maybe mirapenavir, fibrobactam, ceftazidime, avibactam, and ceftolazone, tazobactam. All of the, um, the, the, the two last, of course, to be combined with uh, metronidazole. I think there's interesting uh, developments. It's good to have. Um, something available for the most resistant uh, infections. Uh, but from a stewardship perspective, uh, I think probably we need to reserve these um, for our most um, resistant uh, pathogens for sure. A quick word on duration. Don't forget, this is one of the easiest way to decrease antimicrobial exposure. Multiple studies in ICU patients and in more general patients actually have shown us that the majority of the patients provided source control as adequate, and mind you that this is often not the case, but if it is adequate, four to seven days of treatment is, uh, is enough for the majority of infections in this space. Let's not forget that also in intra-abdominal infections, antimicrobial stewardship is uh, critical, but of course, don't forget to also involve surgeons, interventional radiologists, because of the importance of source control. So my clinical algorithm summarized in patients with abdominal sepsis, of course, we go for antimicrobial therapy and support the patient identify the source of uh, um, the uh, um, sepsis and ask us the question, is source control necessary? Timing is important. I didn't have time to touch upon that, but you do it as soon as possible in severe infections. Minimally invasive if possible, but if it doesn't work, a surgical procedure is still necessary. And don't forget to set 
certain criteria, identify these uh, endpoints you want to uh, uh, evaluate the uh, efficacy of source control uh, on. So in conclusion, dear colleagues, abdominal infections, challenges in many, many different ways. The epidemiology doesn't really change a lot. Uh, let's not forget this uh, new notion that the extent of infection as well as, the, as where the infection was uh, acquired will impact outcome. Resistance is increasing of, course, increasing, of course, with a lot of regional variation. Pivotal role of source control, but again, emphasizing that more than often, it is um, not uh, adequate. Uh, and the shift towards percutaneous treatment, I'm absolutely um, uh, in, in favor of it in the right uh, patient. Some exciting new things coming to us, antimicrobials, new biomarkers, etc. But let's also continue to rely on what we've been doing for a long time that is stewardship. With this, I would like to thank you and end my presentation. I would like to uh, thank Jan very much for the great and concise talk. You managed in 15 minutes to sum up all the information and thank you for the clear messages that you gave, Jan. Thank you. We then, <laughs> Thank you. We move uh, now to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Patrick Harris. Patrick Harris is an ID specialist from uh, the University of Queensland, the Center for Clinical Research. Uh, he's going to um, talk about management of infection by MDR gram-negative pathogens. We welcome uh, Dr. Harris. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Patrick Harris. I'm a microbiologist from uh, Brisbane in uh, Queensland, Australia. And I've been given the task to talk to you all about multi-resistant gram negatives for 15 minutes. So obviously it's a huge topic, so very hard to fit everything into such a small amount of time. I'm gonna concentrate mainly on things that are relatively new and particularly some of these new um, antibiotic drugs that are coming through the development pipeline that are, are particularly interesting. So as I'm sure many of you will know, multi-resistant gram negatives are a huge challenge um, and really threaten uh, modern healthcare in many respects. Particularly these ESBL producing gram negatives, uh, our, our old friends, the Enterobacteraceae or Enterobacterales like E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, which are now extremely common around the world, but also the extremely hard to treat carbapenem resistant strains, uh, as well as um, carbapenem resistant non-fermenters like Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter baumannii. So these are the, the main difficult pathogens that we're thinking about today in terms of uh, the challenges for treatment. Now, normally when we think about this slightly doom laden uh, topic, we often are slightly depressed by the fact that there have been no or very few new drugs in development over many years. But the good news, I guess, is that some of this story is changing and there are new antibiotics coming through the development pipeline that are offering some, some better treatment options for these difficult to treat bugs. And this is a nice summary, I guess, of, of some of where we're up to, particularly a lot of these mushrooming of new beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations um, that have variable degrees of, of activity against different types of resistant strains or resistance mechanisms. So as you can see, we often have uh, familiar drugs like cephalosporins or carbapenems combined with often novel beta-lactamase inhibitors that have different properties. But there also there are some new uh, actual novel beta-lactams or cephalosporins in there like keftolazane or cofidiracol. There are even things like oral carbapenems like tebipenem and a variety of other novel aminoglycosides or tetracyclines, which we won't have time to cover today, which have had some variable success. What we're really going to talk, talk about mainly are these novel beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors. But I think an important point to note is that we're going to have to get more sophisticated about understanding the different resistant mechanisms and the genes that underlie these resistance mechanisms to understand which of these novel drugs are going to be most effective in our patients. And I think this is going to be a big challenge for the laboratories and the clinicians to really try to make sense and make the best use of these new drugs as they come on stream. So before we delve too much into the new drugs that are coming, one strategy we've considered for a while is can we repurpose old drugs against some of these difficult organisms? This is a trial we published a few years ago called the Merino trial. We were hoping to show that we could use an old drug called Piperacillin tezobactam 
uh, to treat some of these ESBL producing in uh, organisms causing serious infections like bloodstream infections. And in fact, there was a wealth of observational data that suggested this may be, um, this may be an option. <clears throat> but unfortunately, when these were compared head to head in a randomized trial, Piperacillin and Tazobactam actually performed quite poorly. And in fact, there was an excess of mortality, meaning that we were unable to show that this drug was non-inferior. And we've been scratching our heads for a little while to try and make sense of why is it that Piperacillin and performed so poorly in the trial. We think a, a, a significant degree of this explanation results from understanding the microbiology and the resistance mechanisms that underline some of these difficult organisms, and particularly those that have more complex or multiple beta lactamase uh, mechanisms within the organism. And one of those uh, beta lactamases that we've hitherto been rather, I guess, rather overlooked is um, these narrow oxacillinases, such as OXA1 or OXA10. By themselves, they've often not been that exciting. They have fairly narrow spectrum activity. But what we've been able to show by taking many of these organisms from patients in the trial and testing them against a reference method is that in fact, these oxygenes push up the MIC closer or beyond the clinical breakpoint. But more importantly, they actually tend to interfere with some of these automated stability tests like the Vitec 2. So not only do you get misleading results where you may test susceptible when in fact they're resistant by a, 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 a reference method. And this, I think, to some extent uh, goes to explain why uh, many of these patients were responded poorly to Piperacil and Tazobactam and why you're getting MICs in the range where it's quite hard to achieve adequate exposure, and particularly in these very sick patients. So if we're thinking about how do we treat these difficult infections, uh, this is quite a good place to start. So the IDSA in America has recently produced a, a published a gu some guidelines uh, to treat some of these difficult organisms, and I'd recommend this as a good place to start. And I think they've quite sensibly also stratified the, the sort of way you might treat these infections according to the severity or the complexity of the, uh, of, of the host and also the site of infection. So for instance, in the Merino trial, Although we found that meropenem was still really the drug to try and beat um, and really was still remains the optimal treatment for serious ESBL infections. If you had a less complex infection like cystitis or pyelonephritis, and you had an oral actively available in vitro susceptible drug, um, then that might well be a very reasonable alternative. And again, although there's not a lot of hard data for this, it seems like a very rational approach and one that I think is used quite widely. We don't want the message to be that you have to use meropenem or carbapenem for every single ES infection. There is certainly room for a bit of nuance. So another drug that's been of interest is this novel cephalosporin uh, combination called keftolazane tazobactam. So this is a new formulation of a cephalosporin that is more stable to some of these AMPC enzymes. It still needs the tazobactam to protect it against uh, ESBLs, but it's really an anti-pseudomonal drug and it's very potent uh, against these strains, particularly some of these more uh, resistant strains that have often multiple com complex mechanisms like efflux or porin mutations that uh, this drug is more, more stable against. Its big hole is though that it's not uh, active against um, uh, carbapenemase producers, particularly metallo or KPC uh, enzymes. But it does retain in vitro at least some susceptibility against ESBL producers. And again, there has been some interest as to whether this could be a carbapenem sparing alternative, rather like Piptazo, who was hoped to be, but rather um, failed to live up to expectations. Unfortunately, this drug has suffered from a major setback in the last couple of years with a, a worldwide recall due to contamination at source. And so we don't know quite when this will come back online, but hopefully sometime in 2022. So we'll have to watch that space. Now, a drug that has been uh, quite widely available now in many parts of the world is keftazidine avibactam. So this is an old, well, well familiar uh, cephalosporin combined with a novel beta-lactamase inhibitor called avibactam. And avibactam is a, an interesting compound. It actually has, uh, it is able to inhibit a whole variety of different um, class A, C, and D type enzymes. But its big hole is it doesn't have any activity against metallobetalactamases like NDM. And we've had various uh, of the usual registry trials to, to, to get it uh, for FDA licensing. And it's certainly equivalent to uh, comparators such mainly against carbapenems for your standard syndromic indications. But what we really lack are pathogen specific trials, particularly against uh, 
carbapenem resistant organisms like KPC specifically. There was the reprise trial, which did include uh, cephalosporin resistant organisms against best available therapy, and it performed fairly well. But what we really need is specific trials against things like KPC or OXA48, where it could be very useful. What we do have, however, is a little bit of um, observational data, and this is a very useful um, observational, well-conducted well, well study from the US called the Crackle study, mainly KPC, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and um, essentially quite a, when you compare it to old-fashioned treatment like colistin, which as we know is a, a very challenging drug to, to give and, and it's not that effective and toxic, there was quite a marked mortality difference and certainly much better outcomes when considered sort of patient-centered um, uh, outcomes like getting home and, and so on, as well as less toxicity. So I think we're going to have to, as I said, be more sophisticated in understanding all these new drugs that are coming uh, onto the market and are becoming increasingly available and understanding the different ranges of, of types of resistance that we can see in these different organisms. We'll probably need to understand a little bit more about the exact class of, of enzyme that might be underlying carbapenem resistance in this case. So um, this is quite a useful table that I think will get more and more complex over the years as we understand more about um, uh, how these drugs work and, and the underlying mechanisms of resistance. One big hole we have is that we don't have good drugs for metallo lactamase producers like NDM. Uh, and this combination is one that is potentially quite promising in theory. Astrianam is actually stable to metallo lactamases but it's often compromised by the co-expression of things like ESBL or AMPC, which could be uh, negated by the activity of the avibactam, and that would allow the astrianam to drug to work. So there are, uh, we're, we're hoping for um, trials to give us some information about this, particularly a revisit trial, which is being conducted as we speak. Um, and hopefully this might give us some, some further information, but we're still waiting to see. At the moment, if you really are up against it and you have to treat, and this is something we have sometimes see in Australia is these M4 uh, metalloenzymes in Enterobacter. Sometimes we have to, uh, I guess, create this drug um, artificially by using Keftaz, Avibactam and Astrianam separately. But, uh, uh, and there does seem to be at least a sketchy uh, amount of data from case reports and personal experience suggests this might be a reasonable approach if you have no other alternatives. There are also a whole range of new beta-lactamase inhibitors that are in development that are very interesting, uh, particularly these uh, DBOs, the diaza bicyclooctanes, um, of which we already have avibactam and relibactam, which we previously mentioned. But some of these are very interesting, like zidibactam actually has activity against metallo lactamases which is new. Uh, some of them also actually have uh, antibiotic properties against penicillin binding proteins themselves and have been termed often a beta-lactam enhancer. Uh, there is this drug Durlobactam, which combined with Solbactam appears to be quite effective against carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter. And there's been a recent report of the ATT&CK trial, which suggests that um, that may be a, a good option, but we're waiting the publication. And then excitingly, there are these new boronic acid derivatives, and particularly this, this QPX, um, which is yet to uh, have, a, have a name, which actually has very broad spectrum activity, including activity against metalloenzymes. So in theory, could restore the activity of a whole range of different beta-lactam drugs. And certainly in vitro, that seems to be the case. We're still waiting to see exactly what drug this is going to be formulated with when it comes to market, but I think that's certainly one uh, to really watch and could be a very interesting compound. And one drug that I think is, uh, again, been increasingly used across the world and now has FDA approval in the US, and we've occasionally used it here in, in, in Australia, is a drug called Cofidrocol. This is a novel uh, siderophore cephalosporin so-called siderophore because it actually comes into the cell via iron uptake uh, active transport so it can get into the periplasmic space and it's also much more stable to a whole variety of different beta lactamases so together is a very promising compound and certainly in vitro has shown good activity against a whole range of different gram negatives including some of those very difficult to treat carbapenemase producers but also some of those intrinsically resistant things like stenotrophomonas or Burkholderia. So again, a very um, uh, exciting compound that may have great clinical utility. Um, and it's gone through its, again, usual sort of registry trials for things like UTI and, 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 and pneumonia, um, where it was uh, uh, found to be essentially equivalent to, to standard therapy. However, um, 
so, and nothing is ever quite as straightforward as one would want it to be. And again, what we really want are these trials that tell us how does it perform in these very difficult pathogens. And this was the credible CR study that was recently reported where they used a, a cofidirocol against best available therapy for difficult to treat multi-resistant organisms. And although this wasn't designed for hypothesis testing, it was more of a descriptive study. The concerning fact was that there was actually an excess mortality in patients uh, who were given cofidirocol compared to BAT. But this was particularly apparently uh, driven by um, patients who had Acinetobacter infection. So there appears to be potentially something about Acinetobacter, whether that was a reflection of the complexity of those patients or whether there's something about Acinetobacter that uh, responds less well to cofidirocol is still a question that is uncertain. And in fact, we have a trial that we're, we're running here through the University of Queensland called Game Changer, which is trying to look at uh, cofidirocol in these patients uh, across the world. So I'll kind of stop there. This is my last slide. Um, and if you, uh, I guess I would refer you to this useful review that's recently just come out, which summarizes uh, quite nicely all the different options for treating these difficult infections. Uh, I think it's essentially the take home message is it's complicated. It's getting more complicated. I think this is going to keep microbiologists and infectious disease physicians in business for quite a while. Uh, and I think it's you know really incumbent on us to think hard about how to treat these, generate as much useful data as we can. Um, but if you're stuck, uh, always uh, ask a friendly infectious disease specialist uh, what they would do, and you'll probably get 20 different opinions. Um, but we're, we're slowly getting better drugs, and I think we're going to get much more effective ways to treat these difficult organisms in the next few years, which is, uh, which is a good thing. So with that, I will stop, and thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Harris uh, very much for his talk. A lot of information, very interesting, uh, very useful. Speaker is uh, Professor Stefan Hagel. He, he's uh, going to discuss the important topic of uh, Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia. Thank you very much uh, for um, contributing to this webinar, Stefan. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, this point for uh, the kind introduction and the possibility to participate in this great meeting. Uh, management of staph aureus bacteremia. It's a very interesting and I think uh, topic which uh, all of us uh, know very well from our daily management. So the question is, what's so special with staph aureus bacteremia? Uh, we just heard uh, the excellent talk uh, from the colleague uh, uh, Professor Harris about MDR, uh, NDM, KPC, OXA48, and multi drug resistant pathogens. And then you look at this uh, uh, susceptibility result from uh, Staph aureus, and everything is susceptible uh, despite uh, the penicillin. So this looks completely innocent. So why a special uh, talk only for uh, Staph aureus? And uh, this is the reason. Uh, Staph aureus is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He's very aggressive. He has uh, plenty of virulence factors, uh, etesines, uh, proteases, super antigens, and this makes this pathogen uh, very nasty for the patients with abscesses, uh, secondary uh, infections, endocarditis. So it's therefore very um, uh, critical to uh, address every patient with this need, um, uh, infection. First of all, three important facts. Um, second most common pathogen in blood cultures. So we did our own statewide blood culture surveillance study with more than 90,000 patients and more than 
330,000 blood cultures. Of them, 13% were positive. And the most common pathogen was E. coli with 26.4%. And the second most common was uh, Staph aureus with 15.6%. Uh, and you see in Germany or here in uh, Thuringia, the part where I'm living, we only have a small problem with MRSA. It was only 2.8% of the isolates were uh, oxazilin, methicillin resistant. This is completely different to uh, other parts of the world. And therefore, it's very important uh, to know your local epidemiology, uh, especially when it's uh, going for empiric uh, therapy when you suspect a uh, staph aureus infection. The second point is uh, staph aureus bacteremia is associated with a very high morbidity. Uh, studies show that you have uh, more than 10% uh, recurrence rate and the mortality is uh, more than 30% in uh, uh, special patient groups. So therefore, it's very important that every positive blood culture with staph aureus must be taken seriously and should be treated. The same, uh, uh, by the way, uh, for uh, Candida. And, but a good point is uh, adequate management can reduce the mortality by about 50%. So uh, Dr. Vogel from our university, uh, she did a meta-analysis in 2015 showing at, uh, a lot of studies uh, uh, looking at uh, adequate management. And she could show that if you do not perform adequate management, the mortality is 27%. And if you adhere to the uh, recommended uh, strategies for management, you can lower the mortality uh, by 50% to 13%. So this is really the good point. So we have aggressive pathogen, but you can uh, help the patient with adequate management. Another very important point for daily care is you have to look at your patient. There's a nice study uh, performed or recently published by a European uh, consortium of uh, 17 study sites with nearly 1,000 patients. And they showed that the longer the blood cultures are positive, the greater the damage. So here you can see uh, days, the controlled blood cultures are positive. So on the next day, one day, up to four days and up to seven days. And you can see here the proportion of patients with a new metastatic focus. So if the blood culture is only positive for one more day, it's 6%, but it's uh, if it's up to five to seven days, every fifth patient have uh, a new metastatic focus. So this is very important. And uh, the same is uh, shown for the 90-day uh, mortality. If you have one day positive blood culture, is 22%. And if it's five to seven days positive, the mortality rate is uh, more than 40%. So this is uh, extremely important. You have to look at your patient and have to look at the risk of uh, secondary uh, metastatic, uh, uh, metastatic um, focus and look for them. There's a high risk of secondary complications. Um, it is between 5 and 10% uh, in the native uh, material like uh, endocarditis, uh, septic joint, or uh, virtual proostromelitis. And if there is uh, foreign material, like for example, uh, intracardiac devices or prosthetic uh, hip or joint replacement, the rate of the secondary infection of these uh, prosthetic devices is roughly 30%. And this is completely different uh, to patients having uh, negative bacteremia, for example, E. coli or Klebsiella. Uh, here, the uh, risk of uh, having a secondary infection is below 5%. So this is also a very important point. So and these are the management recommendations uh, for points. And in the next uh, 10 minutes, I will go uh, 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 through these four points and uh, show you the actual uh, or the up-to-date recommendations. So the first point is diagnostic evaluation and source control. And the diagnostic evaluation is uh, uh, performing a TEE, a transesophageal echocardiography and imaging. And always the question is, is which patients need a TEE? And, um, at the moment, uh, the recommendations are that patients with a supposedly long duration of bacteremia, uh, especially patients with a community-acquired staph aureus uh, bloodstream infection or patients with IV drug abuse. Here is a TE recommended also in patients with presence of cardiac foreign bodies, uh, peripheral or cerebral emboli, like patients with a vertebral osteomyelitis, 
patients who have cardiac risk factors, or if the patient has a persistent positive blood cultures or a persistent suspicion, uh, then you should uh, uh, also uh, redo uh, the TE. The next point is performing um, uh, further imaging. And uh, here, sorry, uh, this is, is a very nice study from 2012, um, which uh, included 115 patients with staph aureus or streptococcal uh, bloodstream infection patients. And here again, uh, the patients had a high risk of uh, secondary complications like community acquired treatment delay, blood cultures more than two, uh, two days positive or long fever. So these are the patients who have a high risk uh, for secondary complications. And in 84 of these 115 patients, in 73% of the patients, they found uh, secondary metastatic uh, uh, infectious foci. So endocarditis, pulmonary abscess, spondylolisthesis, and the vascular infections. So this is very uh, important. And uh, very interesting is, um, uh, sorry, if, uh, that only 60% um, of the patients having these uh, FOTI uh, had some clinical symptoms. So 40% of the patients with some uh, secondary uh, problems, they're clinically silent. So even if you perform proper uh, examination of the patient, you will not find every uh, secondary problem in this patient. This was a patient uh, we cared for, a patient with the second episode of uh, staph aureus plasma infection with a septic shock. The TE was negative, and then we performed a PET scan, and then you can see um, the, the, uh, the pacemaker and the lead this is like a pacemate infection, and this was completely in clinical examination and TEE. It was uh, not obvious that here uh, is the focus of infection. And by the way, you see here the pulmonary abscess and the infection of the knee prothesis. So this is a very um, good uh, method examination to uh, look at your patients who have a high risk for secondary complications. Antipyretic therapy, uh, also very important um, if you have a patient with MSSA infection, so the methicillin oxacillin susceptible staph aureus, um, the recommendation is uh, anti-staphylococcal uh, penicillin, so it's flucloxacillin or oxacillin, or you can also use uh, cefazolin. There is a discussion whether you can also use uh, cefazolin. We have some uh, cons and pros. So the uh, cons for flucloxacillin is that it's more nephro and liver toxic. Uh, to, uh, there's a higher nephro and liver toxicity compared uh, to cefazolin. But for cefazolin, um, the con is that there is the possible inoculum effect. Um, we did our own big meta-analysis with more than 11,000 patients. Um, and here we could show that uh, cefazolin is not inferior uh, to uh, flucloxacillin or uh, oxacillin, but these are all retrospective studies and we are waiting for prospective studies. Uh, one is currently underway in uh, France. But what we know is a therapy with other beta-lactam antibiotics show worse outcome, like piptazo or cefotaxin, uh, ceftriaxone. So you should not use these substances. And the same is also shown uh, if you uh, treat patients with MSSA with vancomycin, you have worse outcome. Different to MRSA, here uh, vancomycin is uh, still number one. Here is like the, the dosing regime. You should give a loading dose, 25 to 30 milligrams per kilogram actual body weight. Um, and then you should continue uh, your therapy with up to 20 milligrams per kilogram every 12 hours. Patients with a normal renal function, then you should perform drug monitoring. This is uh, very important uh, to prevent the nephrotoxicity. And you have two options. Um, the guidelines at the moment, they recommend uh, IUC-based monitoring with a level of 400 to 600 milligrams per hour per liter. And if this is not available, you can use the trough, le uh, at the trough level 15 to 20 milligrams per liter in intermittent infusion. There's no uh, randomized data showing that the AUC-based monitoring uh, is better than the trough le uh, level, but uh, in patients with a high risk of renal toxicity, uh, all the experts uh, think that AUC 
is better, but on the other side, AOC-based monitoring is more complex and you need uh, some computer programs and uh, colleagues who, are, um, who, who know uh, how to uh, calculate uh, the dosing. There are alternative substances. Uh, in most of our patients, uh, we use uh, deptomycin because if you already have a risk for renal toxicity, um, we are not a fan of vancomycin, so we use deptomycin with a dosing of 10 to 12 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, importantly, you are uh, not using it in uh, pulmonary infection because the surfactant is inactivating uh, deptomycin, but the pitfall is there are only a few randomized studies uh, using deptomycin. Also, the newer studies like ceftobipro or ceftarulin, this is uh, the problem at the moment. Uh, what a role of the combination therapy? I can show you three studies dealing with uh, combination therapy. And the first one, I think you know the study uh, from Guy Trades from uh, UK, um, randomized controlled trial, 748 patients, and they did rifampicin uh, 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 as a combination partner uh, to the standard therapy for 14 days. And the primary endpoint at week 12, death, treatment failure, or recurrence, there was no difference between the monotherapy group or the different uh, combination therapy group. It was 17 and 18%. Recently, um, uh, Stephen Tong from Australia also uh, uh, published a very good study, uh, the CAMERA 2 study, also randomized controlled 440 patients were planned with um, cameras A bloodstream infection. And there the idea was a combination of vancomycin mainly in combination uh, with uh, flucloxacillin for the synergistic effect in MRSA. And they had to stop the uh, study after the interim analysis after 343 patients because they could show that patients with the combination therapy, they had a higher risk uh, for acute kidney injury. So patients with a uh, combination of vancomycin and flucloxacillin 23% uh, of the patients showed acute kidney injury compared to 6% only in the vancomycin uh, monotherapy. And overall, at that point, they couldn't show a difference in the primary outcome. And the last trial for combination therapy also recently uh, published uh, by colleagues from Spain, um, also patients with an MRSA bloodstream infection, 155 patients, and they used deptomycin. And the combination therapy was deptomycin plus phosphomycin, uh, two grams, four times daily. And here you can see the results. Overall, there was no treatment success uh, after six weeks um, with 54.1% in the combination therapy group and 42% in the deptomycin alone group. But what you can see here, green, that patients in the combination therapy group, they had definitely better microbi microbiological cure. You can see here, 0% uh, of the patient's microbiological failure after six weeks compared to 11% in the deptomycin monotherapy uh, group. And I think this is a very uh, important point um, that with a combination uh, 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 therapy, uh, the double bactericidal um, hit, you can kill more pathogens uh, earlier. And in a post hoc analysis, they excluded 70 patients with a vascular catheter infection. So the patients with mainly a mild uh, cause of disease. And here, the difference was even greater. Treatment uh, success 51% in the combination therapy uh, group compared to 33 in the monotherapy uh, group. So I think we should do more studies in these uh, very severely ill patients and not patients with only uh, a vascular catheter infection. Um, so the last points are follow-up blood cultures. These are very important um, to perform after 24 hours. This is the uh, recommendation at the moment. If they are still positive, you should uh, look whether you have control the focus, uh, the uh, source of infection, or whether there are any secondary se uh, septic emboli. And the last point, appropriate duration of uh, therapy this is always uh, uh, sometimes a point for discussion with the clinical uh, colleagues. And the recommendation at the moment is uh, at least 14 days in patients with uncomplicated staph aureus uh, bacteri uh, bacteremia. Uh, 
Uncomplicated means the patient has no endocarditis, no implanted foreign bodies, negative blood cultures after 48 to 96 hours, no evidence of deep-seated metastatic uh, infections and fever resolution within uh, 48 to 72 hours after initiation of the therapy. And if the episode is complicated, so all other patients, it's recommended to do at least four weeks uh, of therapy. And then we uh, uh, very often uh, get a question, is oral sequential uh, therapy uh, possi uh, possible? And yes, I think it's possible in selected patients, like patients who have a stable uh, clinical uh, course, uh, infection parameters uh, going down, no fever. And uh, in these patients, I think uh, oralization is uh, feasible and there are more studies showing that it's safe. But if you do oral sequential therapy, you should use the adequate uh, substances, antibiotics, looking for good uh, oil, uh, oral bioavailability, for example, cephalexine, uh, uh, primetoprim, uh, sulfamethoxazole, linezolids, or levofloxacine each, um, maybe in combination with uh, rifampicin if you have a foreign body infection. So the summary, it's always, always take stuff oral spectrum seriously. Uh, very important to look at your patients. Where is the focus of infection? Do immediate uh, source control. Uh, assess the risk of secondary septic complications uh, with a TEE, or if you uh, have the availability uh, PET scan. This is really a good uh, possibility. And then a proper diagnostic workup and therapy improves outcome and reduces mortality by up to fifty percent. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you, Stefan, for your very interesting and useful talk. It is very impressive. 40% uh, uh, of uh, cases with uh, the, the POCAI that they're, they're not yet uh, noticed, they're very impressive. Thank you very much. And uh, we will move uh, on with uh, our next speaker, that is Professor Chodras. Uh, he's a ID physician and internist from the University of Athens, and also he's the a scientific lead of the Ministry of Health of Greece against COVID. Uh, thank you, Professor Chodras. Now we're gonna. Uh, Good morning from Greece. I would mm -hmm. like to thank you for inviting me to present uh, on the topic of viral infections and intensive care unit during this webinar of the Isaac. Uh, I think uh, it's a very important topic, and uh, we have to be very uh, careful uh, thinking about uh, viral infections in ICU subjects um, uh, hospitalized uh, with severe clinical pictures uh, that uh, besides pneumonia, respiratory failure, and ARDS uh, dominated right now by the novel coronavirus could include other manifestations from the central or the peripheral nervous system, viral induced shock, uh, and others. We recently reviewed uh, this subject uh, uh, very recently and I encourage you to read this publication to get a, a more uh, clear picture of uh, the viral uh, infections uh, in the ICU context subject. Uh, in this paper, we have uh, uh, done an analysis of, uh, of uh, viruses that have uh, uh, been circulating in specific areas of the world, like MERS coronavirus in the Arabian Peninsula, or even influenza. In Asia, another virus that have a worldwide distribution, like uh, adenoviruses, uh, herpes viruses, um, influenza, and uh, parainfluenza. Of course, uh, now SARS coronavirus is dominant, but um, uh, we need to be aware of the uh, epidemiological uh, uh, associations, especially the seasonal uh, circulation of specific viruses like parainfluenza in early autumn and late spring, and uh, enteroviruses during the summer. Coming to viral diagnostics, uh, nucleic acid amplification tests are preferred. Uh, they have uh, the best sensitivity and specificity. Rapid tests can be used uh, with uh, the, the advantage of turnaround times. 
Uh, and of course, um, uh, one thing needs to think about specificity issues and sensitivity is always lower than nucleic acid testing. Uh, and uh, when we talk about uh, low respiratory tract infections, BL sampling is preferred. Speaking about SARS coronavirus, I think the most important message is uh, the effectiveness of vaccine, the vaccine, the current circulating vaccine against deaths. And in Greece, um, both mRNA vaccines, uh, the Oxford vaccine and the j, &J vaccine uh, uh, have been circulating. We saw after a recent an analysis of all the data up until October 2021, 91% risk reduction in our vaccinated population uh, with uh, analyzing the National Public Health Organization data. The amazing thing was that uh, the, the proportion of reduction was similar in, uh, in lower risk groups like the younger, groups ages 25 to 49, when compared to the ages 80 plus, where you can see the outcome of death here, of course, it's uh, in the hundreds and here it's in the tens. Uh, but this uh, this re reduction uh, uh, is uh, the proportional reduction is similar, uh, an amazing effect of the vaccine in protecting uh, even younger, lower uh, risk groups. Um, the WHO and, uh, and the, co the commission ha have set a global vaccination target of 70% in 2022 that was recently agreed upon. Uh, hopefully uh, this will be achieved and will lead uh, to less emergence of uh, variants, of uh, virus variants, together with the booster uh, uh, vaccination that appears to, to have an, a significant additive effect in the reduction of deaths. This is a study from Israel published in The Lancet. And these are uh, the implementation according to age group curves that uh, led to a much lower incidence uh, of the virus circulating uh, in, in Israel. And, and hopefully uh, some people uh, say now uh, that uh, booster vaccination is part of, of, uh, of the normal regimen of, of, of the vaccine. And hopefully this will be uh, implemented widely uh, before the end of this wave. Uh, already several European countries are doing it. Uh, with regards to the Omicron variant, I think it's important to realize that uh, Omicron has been circulating before it's, uh, the announcement based on uh, the rate of the evolution uh, and the, the rate that uh, the, vir the virus acquires mutations. We will find it everywhere. The big question about Omicron is uh, whether it has an increased likelihood of transmission compared to the standard uh, Delta vi variant that's dominant right now, and whether it will be associated with uh, increased severity and a risk of hospitalization and death. Uh, susceptibility to drugs and therapeutics and um, uh, reinfection or vaccine breakthrough infection is another important uh, priority uh, question for investigations with regards to Omicron. Uh, coming back to influenza, uh, prior to COVID, it was the most frequent preventable cause of death, hundreds of thousands uh, per year. We did not see any influenza during the last winter in Europe. Uh, they, probably due to the non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention um, uh, and uh, the measures uh, instituted uh, across nations, the lockdowns. But right now, the question about uh, moving to a, uh, to, a, to, a, to a winter season that will have influenza as well is important. Already outbreaks in the United States, 37 positivity rate in this Ann Arbor, Michigan outbreak in a university campus. Uh, we can prevent this by encouraging our patients to be vaccinated uh, as doctors, as physicians. Uh, this is analysis from CDC, millions of illnesses prevented thousands of deaths in the 2019 uh, season. Of course, coronavirus is more important, but, uh, but uh, we, can, we have to do everything we can to, to restrict uh, uh, the complications uh, and, and effects of um, under-vaccinating our, uh, our general population. We do not want to see a twin pandemic this year. Uh, Coming to the issue of therapy relevant to ICU to the ICU context, remember that um, um, immunosuppressed individuals may harbor uh, viruses resistant to thalamivir, and one needs to discuss the option of thalamivir either inhaled or in intravenous uh, uh, with uh, uh, experts. Uh, with regards to RSV, it's a common infection in respiratory tract infection adults. It's underappreciated especially in high-risk uh, individuals, has similar outcomes with influenza with regards to needs for ICU, mortality, and length of hospital stay. Another evolution in the field is uh, the first clinical trial uh, using an mRNA vaccine from one of the COVID vaccine companies. Uh, I think that uh, we will see uh, uh, good prevention uh, efforts uh, in this front uh, in the near future. 
and hopefully this mRNA vaccine will deal with the disease that's not only a disease of kids, but also a disease of adults, especially high risk ones. Uh, with regards to more exotic pathogens, hantavirus, uh, pulmonary syndrome, uh, prominent in Americas, uh, and of course, uh, exposure to rodents, uh, recent stay in endemic areas, uh, and uh, severe pneumonia with a, a, a good epidemiological history uh, may lead you to the diagnosis. Um, I remind you here a huge outbreak in uh, the Yosemite National Park that led to spread, uh, international spread in several countries. Uh, one needs to be aware of IV intravenous fluid um, overload and risk of pulmonary edema due to capillary leak uh, in hantavirus, and ECMO has been used along uh, with ribavirin. With regards to neurological syndromes, encephalitis um, and, and meningitis due to uh, herpes viruses, um, uh, CMV in immunosuppressed individuals, West Nile virus, uh, of course, uh, in, um, in, uh, from arboviruses, and SARS coronavirus too, of course, has been associated with, um, with uh, uh, neurological syndrome. Climate change has an effect on arbovirus circulation. Um, we know that uh, uh, some of the vectors get together. Uh, uh, for example, here, uh, birds and, and, uh, and uh, mosquitoes got together in small pools of water, and let, uh, that uh, was the main hypothesis behind the, the big outbreak in California in 2015. We know that West Nile virus will be with us over the next uh, a uh, few decades. Uh, it's a virus difficult to, 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 to do good surveillance. Less than 1% have uh, CNS symptoms, especially high risk individuals. Uh, we had a huge outbreak in 2018 uh, with an upsurge in vector. And uh, we have uh, cases in humans all, all over Southern Europe and cases in birds and horses. Um, uh, if you have good surveillance like Germany, you discover the virus there as well. I'm, I'm sure I'm the reporting of this virus occurred due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Other arbo arboviruses of interest, uh, dengue, and the uh, uh, reinfection with another serotype leading to uh, dengue hemorrhagic uh, fever and shock syndrome, um, uh, and Zika virus that can give you Guillain-Barré syndrome, along with influenza, are important uh, viruses that we need to keep in mind, especially in the, uh, in the appropriate epidemiological context. Poliomyelitis is uh, still a public health event of international concern, according to a very recent statement of uh, the IHR emergency meeting in WHO. Th these are the areas that have uh, prevalent polio virus, as you can see, uh, several areas in, in Africa and, uh, and Southeastern Asia. But I want to remind you, non-polio enterovirus and acute flaccid paralysis so had huge outbreaks by enterovirus A71 in Hungary, Bulgaria, India, Taiwan, and the United States, and an outbreak of enterovirus B68 uh, that caused uh, uh, encephalitis and meningitis in, in several patients in the United States, and 23% of those required intubation. Uh, coming to cardiogenic uh, shock and myocarditis, of course, SARS coronavirus 2, amongst others, influenza, adenovirus, and enterovirus have been associated, especially Coxsackie B uh, virus uh, with a cardiogenic sequela. And I, I think it's important to realize here that uh, uh, we need to think about uh, viruses uh, when we have a, a patients presenting with uh, myocarditis with no other uh, sufficient explanation. Uh, Hemorrhagic fever, cause of um, uh, vir viral causes, uh, Crimean Congo in the European Union, Ebola in Africa, yellow fever and dengue with um, uh, worldwide distribution. Uh, I remind you the huge outbreak of Ebola in West Africa with thousands of, uh, uh, of uh, cases and deaths, uh, significant underestimation, of course, due to uh, limited diagnostic testing. And the differential diagnosis of hemorrhagic fever should include among uh, uh, viruses like yellow fever, dengue, premium Congo, influenza, Lassa, but also bacterial pathogens as well. Uh, we had the case of premium Congo in a farmer from uh, Bulgaria that uh, visited our country, uh, a, Greek, a Greek farmer that was working in Bulgaria and came back to our country and, uh, and uh, became positive. Um, acute liver failure. Again, uh, a cause of distributive shock as well, hepatitis viruses, herpes viruses, and of course, dengue and yellow fever are amongst the causes. Uh, dengue, 2.5 billion people at risk, uh, several autochthonous cases in the European Union over the last few years. 
This is the distribution of uh, dengue over the last three months uh, worldwide. As you can see, it's um, in a specific uh, um, climate zones, um, uh, dengue distribution. Uh, dengue can give you a hemorrhagic fever or, or a shock syndrome, uh, especially in people that um, get infected with another serotype. And uh, we have seen cases in Spain and France. We need to be aware of dengue. It's a, it's a threat. It's an emerging threat uh, for um, uh, the continent uh, over the next few years. Yellow fever introduction and reintroduction uh, from um, uh, areas in Africa and America, especially Brazil. Lots of tourists there brought it back to France and Switzerland. Uh, we need to be aware of, uh, of yellow fever when we have the appropriate epidemiological history. With regards to pancreatitis, uh, just to mention here that mumps remains the most common virus associated with pancreatitis and severe pancreatitis. However, you may not know that SARS coronavirus 2 um, uh, diagnosis in, pa in patients with acute pancreatitis increased severity, organ failure, and 30 day mortality uh, if it was co existent. So, uh, important to realize that uh, SARS coronavirus has changed the, 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 the landscape with regards to acute pancreatitis in the co context of viral infection. Um, another last thing that I wanted to, to touch upon, the immune dysregulation associated with severe disease and um, uh, acute viral or reactivation of viral infections, immunomodulation, diabetes, obesity, malnourishment, uh, transfusion on its own, age extremes, corticosteroid use, HIV AIDS, chemotherapy and bone marrow suppression, and of course, critical illness on its own, could lead to this immune dysregulation and severe viral infection acquisition or reactivation in the ICU. Whether you're immunocompetent or even more important, compromised, we know that for CMV as a fact. And in these cases, one needs to make a decision uh, based on clinical judgment um, and uh, the clinical significance of whether to treat or not, on whether they have reactivation or acute infection. And of course, um, this stands true for other, for other uh, viruses like Epstein Bar, Herpes Simplex, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Varicella zoster viruses. And of course, uh, iatrogenic immunosuppression is very important, especially uh, in uh, compromised critical individuals. Adenovirus is very important. Uh, here we have some medication like Cydofovir that can be used, uh, CNV, where you can use uh, Gansiclovir especially here in transplanted uh, individuals and varicella zoster virus, uh, especially with um, uh, transplanted individuals and, and pregnant uh, uh, individuals. Finishing my talk, uh, just a, a comment about treatment and prevention. Uh, it depends on identified pathogen. Uh, for some, it's only supportive and uh, numerous investigational trials are ongoing. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have enough progress uh, for all viruses. Uh, we need to be aware of what's going on in the field and, 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 and see the relevant literature. It's time we face a, a situation where it's very difficult to decide what to do with our patients. For a comprehensive review, look at our paper uh, published earlier this year. In conclusion, viral infections uh, occur in the ICU. Uh, we should watch um, uh, uh, for a reactivation in, in especially immunocompromised individuals, most commonly associated with respiratory syndromes, but other syndromes, we should not overlook them. Uh, infection control is important in the ICU environment, especially for respiratory infections to avoid outbreaks. SARS coronavirus has changed the landscape, but we have to remain alert and we have to very carefully um, think about alternative diagnosis, especially when uh, SARS coronavirus 2 uh, diagnosis is, is not there. And uh, we hope to see more progress in antivirus and vaccines uh, in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, the opportunity to discuss this very interesting uh, subject. I would like to thank Professor Chodras for his interesting talk. And with uh, Professor Chodras' uh, talk, uh, um, we completed the first uh, thematic session uh, by email. Thank you. If there are any other questions, uh, we're going to have a 10 minutes break and we will move on in 10 minutes uh, to our uh, second th thematic uh, session. I would like to uh, welcome 
Professor Pedro Povoa. Uh, he's professor of medicine in the Nova University of of Lisbon, and he's going to talk to us about biomarkers. Uh, welcome, uh, Pedro, and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much, Despoina, for this very kind invitation. And I also would like to say to say good morning or good afternoon or good night to all the people, uh, every people that is uh, watching, uh, depending on the time zone. And also congratulations for this um, very uh, important um, uh, meeting and webinar on the topics of infection critical care. So my talk is on the role of biomarkers in sepsis diagnosis in these patients. Sorry. So these are my disclosures related to this topic. And uh, I will address mainly the most studied biomarkers in sepsis diagnosis, CRP and PCT. And the, also how can the biomarkers be helpful in our clinical practice at bedside and how they can improve the sepsis diagnosis. And uh, there, are, there has been lots, lots of research on biomarkers, and up to uh, September 2019, 258 biomarkers have been identified, and the number of papers published is always increasing over the years. But there are, there are not that many new biomarkers coming or being discovered. But one of the problems is that after having so many biomarkers, we did not yet um, discovered the ideal biomarker. And also one of the problems is there is no gold standard of diagnosis of infection, as for sure you already noticed from all the, um, the previous presentations. And this is an overview of uh, CRP and PCT uh, concerning they are not exactly the same in terms of properties. One is hormokine, and the CRP is more acute phase protein. Very low levels uh, in healthy people. They increase a lot when there is a stimulus. The source of PCT is almost all cells. CRP comes from the liver. They begin to increase bit, a little bit earlier PCT concern, comparing to CRP. CRP has a doubling time of eight hours. Uh, the peak is earlier in PCT comparing to C-reactive protein. However, the half-life of PCT is longer than of uh, CRP. There are some risk of uh, false negatives in patients on steroids, immunosuppression, profound neutropenia with no effect on CRP, uh, <coughs> renal failure and renal replacement therapy and dialysis doses can have an effect on PCT level, almost no effect on CRP, but the chronic liver failure and acute liver failure is an effect on the CRP, but no effect on PCT. Some cancer and some diseases can increase a lot. PCT, medullary thyroid carcinoma, and small cell lung cancer. And CRP, there are some diseases that by themselves, like SLE, systemic sclerosis, dermatomyositis, Jogan syndrome, ulcerative colitis, leukemia, and GVHD do not increase CRP unless there is an infection. And the, the issue of distinguished bacterial and viral infections, as you see in my talk, is not good for both. So how can biomarkers be helpful in clinical practice? And in our daily life at the, at the bedside, we ask questions. And there are two things. One is the infection that is treated with antibiotics and source control, uh, if, if uh, necessary, and sepsis that is uh, the... the, the the prognosis improves a lot for early recognition and supportive care. And so all these problems, mainly related to infection, are connected to questions. Prognosis, what is the risk of poor outcome? Screening, is this patient at risk of infection? Diagnosis, is this patient infection or infected or not infected? Response to therapy and also duration of antibiotic therapy. And in my talk, we are only dealing with this question the, concerning diagnosis. And when we are dealing with diagnosis, we can look at 
a single determination of a biomarker or serial determination, let's say the kinetics of the biomarker before the diagnosis. And this is a study that we performed a, a couple of years ago, looking at several biomarkers to distinguish between VAP and uh, non-VAP in patients under mechanical ventilation and, and, uh, and um, uh, bacteriologic document is VAP. And as you can see, CRP had a quite good diagnostic performance at the day of suspicion. This is another interesting study performed in an emergency department comparing, they want to compare patients with sepsis and non-septic series. They evaluate a lot of biomarkers. And the performance of the, all these biomarkers was not that good. They discriminated poorly between sepsis and non-septic series. And they tried different combinations of biomarkers and no combination performed better than CRP alone. The issue of distinguished viral and bacterial infection is a, a, a good, uh, important topic and PCT is frequently presented as being able to do it. This are a, one meta-analysis and a recent study in the met, this meta-analysis uh, with 12 studies. The summary of receiver operating characteristics curve for a PCT to distinguish viral from bacterial as an AUC of 0.73. So as a moderate diagnostic power. So you have a, a one error in every four patients. And in this uh, study published recently comparing pure viral infection and bacterial co-infection and afterwards matching the, the, the patients, you can see that the area under the curve for PCT is really, really poor. So we cannot, we cannot rely on PCT to distinguish viral from bacterial co-infection. Another important thing is to, um, to, to see how uh, is the behavior of biomarkers if you have several um, uh, uh, infections in the same patient in, the, in sequence. And the peak of PCT in a secondary, a second infection episode is only 10% of the first one. CRP also decreases, it is, is around 70% uh, of the first peak. So if you have several infections, you have to think that the second peak is much lower in PCT. Another uh, way of looking or using biomarkers is is to look at serial determinations to the kinetics of the biomarkers as a predictor of infection. And this is maybe one of the first works looking at that behavior from our group that we clearly see that CRP begins to increase before the diagnosis of infection. And those patients without infection are not receiving antibiotics, it remains very low. And looking at the, at the maximal daily CRP change, um, it has a good diagnostic performance of an AUC of 0.86. And if you combine this with an absolute value around nine that we already um, is, um, evaluated before in another study, the risk of infection or the, the diagnosis of infection has a sensitivity of 0.92, a specificity of 0.82 with a good negative and positive likelihood ratio. We've done the same more recently in patients under mechanical ventilation for non-infectious reasons. And if we look at the slope of CRP in the first five days of mechanical ventilation, the, the slope has a, 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 a good relationship with the risk of, uh, of having an infection. And if we look at the curve of disease probability is very clear for CRP that the higher the slope, the higher the risk of having a, um, a ventilator associated with pneumonia. And for the, in the same patients looking at PCT, this is the cur curve of disease probability that is very difficult to interpret. And a patient with an average increase of CRP of one milligram per, day, per deciliter per day has a 62% greater chance of having a VAP compared with patients with no change. This is a recently published uh, trial trying to assess how PCT could be useful in distinguishing pneumonia and pneumonitis in patients with a high risk of aspiration. 
Uh, and uh, the, 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 the two arms is 81 patients with PCT arms and 78 with standard of care where they have availability to, to assess to CRP. And as you can see, the proportion of patients on antibiotics based on PCT were much higher in patients with using PCT, but not significant between with the standard of care, but they have longer duration of mechanical ventilation, longer duration of length of stay, like in other trials, like the past trial almost 10 years ago. So the use of PCT to guide therapy does not modify exposure to antibiotics in patients intubated with coma. And finally, I'm going to show you this data that is in CRP and uh, also albumin that came from a, a big database of community acquired bacteremia uh, uh, in Denmark, where I also work, looking at the, the biomarkers before and after the bacteremia, because we have access to the values before and after the bacteremia. Also, uh, and we have more than 24,000 measurements of CRP and more than 21,000 measurements of plasma albumin. And it is clear that some days before the diagnosis of bacteremia, CRP begin to increase. And so we decided to look at the values and the changes of CRP before the, the, the diagnosis of bacteremia and using um, a broken stick methodology. So we performed two linear regressions and to, to see uh, with different time intervals to see where is the, the great change in, uh, in the slope of these two linear regression. And for CRP was minus uh, three days before the diagnosis. For albumin, one day, one and a half day before the diagnosis. And the slopes before for CRP was a slight decrease followed by a sharp increase. And concerning albumin, almost no change before and then a sharp decrease uh, in the slope. So the change in the biomarkers began some days before the diagnosis. And concerning the use of the biomarkers for before infection, in the, the infection day uh, to exclude the infections, we do not have many green lights, more yellow, uh, yellow lights, so, but they can be helpful if correctly used. So in conclusion, biomarkers are useful in the diagnosis of sepsis and infection, but we have to know the biology, the strengths and limitations of each biomarker. Use cautiously the biomarkers and use the, those that can give you additional information for your problem. But biomarkers are not a panacea. They should never be used solely. Do not treat the numbers. Always use them in conjunction with a complete clinical evaluation. So you should look also at the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Epovoa, thank you very much for uh, the talk with uh, so clear messages about biomarkers. That is an issue uh, that tantalizes the I, I, I see you physicians and how to use them and uh, how useful or not useful they are. Thank you. It was a great talk. I would like to move uh, uh, to our next speaker, Dr. Lisbeth De Bush, internist intensivist uh, from the University of Ghent. Uh, Lisbeth, uh, he was uh, uh, the um, principal investigator of a big study, the Diana study on de-escalation. She has a, a lot of expertise uh, uh, on de-escalation and she's gonna uh, present uh, the escalations in uh, the following 15 minutes. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for accepting the invitation. So thank you for this introduction and also for giving me the opportunity to give this presentation on uh, de-escalation. Um, 
Oh, something goes wrong here. Something is wrong with my screen sharing. I can't, I cannot move through my So, sorry for the inconveniences. Um, so thank you for the invitation uh, and for giving me the, the opportunity to give this presentation on uh, antibiotic de-escalation. I have no conflicts of uh, interest. So when we are talking about antimicrobial de-escalation, we have to make sure that we are all using the same definition. And there have been some controversies regarding uh, the de-escalation definition. And in 2019, uh, a position statement was published from uh, a task force of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. And here, de-escalation was defined as making a switch from a broad spectrum to a more narrow spectrum agent or an agent with a presumed lower ecological uh, impact. On the other hand, uh, de-escalation was also defined as uh, stopping the component of uh, a combination therapy. And here we have two scenarios. On the one hand, uh, combination therapy that was initiated with the intention to provide double coverage for certain pathogens. And uh, on the other hand, uh, combination therapy that was initiated to cover pathogens, uh, resistant pathogens, for instance, like MRSA, that uh, in the end were uh, not cultured. And, Early discontinuation of all antimicrobial therapy, if an infection was ruled out, uh, was no longer considered to be uh, de-escalation. So um, de-escalation uh, takes place during uh, a treatment course, so not in the immediate beginning, but um, at the moment in time, when more information becomes available uh, on the one hand regarding the clinical course uh, of a patient, but also on uh, the microbiology uh, results. And even if these uh, microbiology results uh, come back negative, they can be informative and they can uh, trigger potential de-escalation. So we move from an empirical therapy uh, that is often broad spectrum in a critically ill uh, patient, and we go to a more targeted uh, definitive uh, therapy. So the task force uh, gives a strong recommendation to perform uh, de-escalation within 24 hours of definitive culture results and uh, antibiogram availability, but with a low uh, quality of uh, evidence. 
So um, de-escalation by stopping a component of combination therapy is quite easy, but de-escalation by making a switch from a broad spectrum to a more narrow spectrum agent has been proven to be much more uh, difficult. We have uh, some guidance in the literature, but it's also not straightforward. So we have uh, two important ranking systems. On the one hand, we have the ranking system that was proposed from uh, a French uh, group, uh, the group of WISE. And here, uh, beta-lactam antibiotics uh, are ranked. And this ranking was constructed based on uh, a Delphi uh, procedure. On the other hand, we have the ranking system proposed by the group of Madras Kelly. And um, here, all uh, agents are uh, ranked uh, by uh, giving them a score that reflects their uh, spectrum of uh, activity. But as you can see here in the table, there are uh, some inconsistencies between both uh, ranking uh, systems. And also uh, a lot of the newer uh, agents, uh, such as the uh, beta-lactam combined with a beta-lactam um, inhibitor, um, um, they are not included in these uh, rankings. So um, de-escalation is defined clearly, but performing it in a real practice is not that straightforward. So here I would like to uh, share another ranking system that was used in the publication of Muring in 2020. It's more easy, more easy to use also in daily practice. Um, and it's also interesting because it not only uses the spectrum uh, of activity of uh, the agents, but it also includes some uh, stewardship uh, aspects. Um, so you can see in rank four, they have placed some uh, protected agents. So agents that need um, prior authorization uh, often, or that are protected because of the fact that they are uh, costly or uh, they have a lot of toxicity or um, they have the potential to induce a lot of uh, resistance. So do we do de-escalation on a worldwide scale? This is something that we try to investigate in the Diana study. This was an uh, international observational prospective study endorsed by the European Society of Intensive Care. And we included adults critically ill patients that were prescribed an empirical antimicrobial therapy for a suspected or a confirmed uh, bacterial infection. And we managed to include almost 1,500 patients. We try to align our definition as much as possible uh, with the definition that was proposed by the task force. Uh, so the escalation had to take place uh, within the first three days of empirical therapy and was done by a discontinuation of one or more antimicrobials of an empirical combination therapy or the replacement of an antimicrobial agent uh, where the treating physician had the intention to narrow the spectrum of uh, activity. So we try to capture the intention because a ranking system is uh, not uh, in place. To our surprise, we saw that only 16% uh, of empirical prescriptions were uh, de-escalated by uh, day three, which was much lower than expected because in previous publications, this was between 25 and, and 81%. And even if we extended the potential time frame to uh, de-escalate to five or seven days, um, this number uh, was still much lower than was uh, prescribed previously. And unfortunately, we did not capture uh, the reasons why de-escalation did not take place. So we don't have a firm explanation for this uh, finding. De-escalation was mainly performed uh, by discontinuation of a component of combination therapy and only in one out of three cases by uh, narrowing the spectrum uh, of activity. In 13% of cases, um, de-escalation was performed by combining both uh, strategies. The main drivers uh, to de-escalate uh, empirical therapy were initiating with uh, a broad spectrum 
combination therapy, uh, the presence of microbiological confirmation, and then two findings that may seem a little bit surprising, uh, more in patients with septic shock and more in patients with a need for source control. But on the other hand, this is not that surprising because the more severely ill patients at uh, presentation, uh, such as our critically ill patients, are prescribed more combination and broad spectrum therapy in the empirical phase. So it's also more easily to uh, perform the escalation. We also saw that de-escalation was performed more in patients with a favorable clinical evolution, which was captured by a Delta SOFA score that uh, evolved well. So what are our aims uh, when uh, we are de-escalating? Um, so first of all, of course, you want to keep the, the individual patient safe, but on the other hand, we would like to reduce uh, the emergence of multidrug resistance. Uh, we would like to reduce uh, side effects of our antimicrobial treatment, and we would like to reduce costs. So first of all, are we keeping the individual patients safe? We have some evidence in the literature that uh, indeed uh, de-escalation seems to be uh, a safe strategy. So here you can see the results of a systematic review that was done by the group of Alexis Taba. Um, and they investigated the impact of the escalation on uh, mortality. And they saw a protective effect uh, of uh, the escalation uh, regarding mortality. However, uh, the authors uh, said that uh, we have to be very prudent with the interpretation of this uh, result um, because only one randomized controlled trial, so the only randomized controlled trial that is published uh, until now from the group of Mark Leone, um, was included in this analysis. Um, the primary end, uh, uh, end point for this uh, randomized controlled trial uh, is ICU length of stay. And here, um, the study uh, failed to show uh, non-inferiority regarding ICU length of stay. Uh, regarding mortality, they saw no uh, difference, but uh, the study was clearly underpowered uh, for this uh, end point. On the other hand, multiple cohort studies were included, uh, and here the pooled results uh, showed a decrease uh, in mortality. However, uh, as the escalation was mainly performed in the improving patient, um, there is a very high uh, risk for bias. What about clinical cure? Um, so this is what we investigated in the Diana study. Uh, here also, uh, regarding survival and clinical cure on day seven, um, we saw protective effect of de-escalation compared to the non-de-escalated uh, patients. Um, we did some very complex uh, uh, statistical uh, analysis and we tried to adjust for time varying confounding as much uh, as possible. But also here we have to be honest, it was an observational study, so uh, residual confounding is also likely in uh, our study. Because of the sake of time, I will only um, touch the topic of uh, reducing emergence of uh, multidrug uh, resistance. So uh, here I would like to present some of um, the results um, of also an investigation in our setting in Ghent University Hospital. We did a retrospective observational study and we look to the emergence of resistance following uh, de-escalation or continuation of uh, therapy after uh, prescribing uh, anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam uh, antibiotics. And we saw uh, no difference in the emergence of resistance to uh, the initially prescribed uh, antimicrobial, and also no difference in the emergence of multidrug resistance uh, on day 14 uh, following um, the empirical prescription. <clears throat> 
The task force uh, states that no statement can be made regarding uh, the effect of de-escalation um, on the development of multi-drug resistance because there is not much evidence available and the evidence that is available is coming from uh, observational studies uh, such as the study that I showed uh, before. In addition, uh, many other unanswered questions remain regarding uh, antimicrobial de-escalation uh, and further research is really required. First of all, uh, we don't know the exact impact of different agents on uh, microbiome uh, disruption. And uh, it's now a well-known fact that microbiome disruption is not the same thing as uh, the spectrum of activity of an agent. We also do not know the impact of a consecutive exposure to two or more antimicrobial agents. And we also do not know the exact impact of late versus early de-escalation and the potential impact uh, of rapid uh, diagnostics to enable more early de-escalation. So in my opinion, uh, antimicrobial de-escalation is um, a very important um, therapeutic strategy with a lot of potential, but it has to be seen as a part of uh, an antimicrobial stewardship strategy. And to be able to perform um, de-escalation, uh, it's also important that we think about our first uh, step of uh, prescribing a rational empirical antimicrobial prescription. So we have to do a good diagnostic work of source control and microbiological sampling because we have seen that de-escalation is it's much more easy when we have microbiology results uh, available. We have to do a good patient history and know our local ecology because the escalation may not be an excuse to prescribe the most um, broad spectrum agents that are, are available. And after the empirical prescription, it's important to do frequent re-evaluations, uh, do the diagnostics all over if necessary, uh, additional source control if necessary, look at the clinical course of your patient, and then in multidisciplinary uh, meetings, discuss the patient and try to predefine uh, the duration of treatment. And if you see that in the end, an infection is not present and uh, maybe there is an alternative diagnosis, then we have to have the guts to just stop our uh, antimicrobials. But if an infection is present, yeah, then we have to talk about duration and de-escalation. And stopping a component of combination therapy, that's quite easy and we have to do it uh, once uh, possible. Um, switching uh, from a broad to a narrow spectrum agent, uh, that's more difficult. And uh, it also has to be seen in the light of treatment duration. If you're only going to treat your patient for an additional one or two days, maybe then in that case, it's not um, necessary to make the switch. But if you are treating for a longer duration, at that point in time, we have to try to uh, switch to more narrow spectrum uh, agents. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Dear Lisbeth, thank you very much. Very useful uh, presentation, a very nice um, algorithm, and also very important that you uh, also pinpointed not only the answer, but the unanswered uh, issues with the escalation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Zeroen Schouten from Radboud University, Netherlands. Uh, he's also senior researcher in uh, the um, uh, in, in quality control. Uh, Schouten, Dr. Schouten has a very strong expertise on antimicrobial stewardship that uh, he's going to present uh, today. A particularly important during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Zeron, because I know that you're overloaded clinically. Thank you very much for putting that in your uh, overloaded uh, program and accepting the invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nesprina, and um, I'm uh, grateful for the invitation.
So yes, today we're talking about challenges in stewardship during the COVID-19 epidemic and uh, or pandemic, we should say, actually. Um, these are my disclosures. And let's first look at what actually happened since uh, COVID started in early 2020. And I think these, are, this, these figures were one of the most impressive ones that I've seen um, if you look at the overall picture. So it looks at hospital-acquired infections in the United States. These are CDC data. And it shows that from the start of 2020 on, we see a, a huge increase in the number of, um, uh, of, of catheter-related bloodstream infections, uh, but also VAE, so the ventilator uh, associated events, so the uh, VAPs mainly. And you see that as, com as, as compared to the year before, there's a huge increase in the, diagnos in the diagnosis of these infections. Uh, also, you see, obviously, as, as had been predicted, that, um, the, um, that the, the presence of uh, post-operative wound infections, like for colon surgery or other surgery, actually went down greatly. And that's, many, uh, uh, that's very likely due to the fact that there just were less operations going on. But from the start on, we've seen that bacteria infections have actually been um, worrying us in, in, uh, in, in general ICU care, but also in ICU. And early figures already looked at the role of bacteria infections early on in COVID. And as uh, shown here in many studies that were all from 2020, uh, reported uh, numbers of uh, bacterial co-infections, so early infections, uh, were low, right? So low percentages of, um, of concomitant infections uh, together with COVID. However, when a patient was um, a longer in ICU, the, 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 the amount of bacterial infections or the, the incidence in, uh, grew. And that's just been seen consistently. Also in this study, which I think is a really nice lab, rapid uh, um, a review and meta-analysis of all the data that were available and they continue doing this, you see that early bacterial core infections uh, amount to about 3.5%, uh, uh, but then later on in the course, we see more bacterial secondary infections during admission, especially in ICU. Now, very strikingly in these data, almost 70% of COVID patients received antibacterial treatment whatsoever in any case, right? So there seems to be quite some over-treatment in, in these uh, patients. And again, here, we have to make a difference between co-infection early on and super-infection or later nosocomial infection by other respiratory pathogens than SARS-CoV-2 virus in patients who are infected with COVID. And there is a difference indeed in the type of pathogens that we see. So in the early uh, pathogens, uh, it, not, you know, not strange, actually, we see Haemophilus influenzae, we see Streptococcus pneumonia, sometimes also some Klebsiella, actually, that was a little bit striking in these data. But then in the later phase, if you will, in the super infections, we see the usual pathogens, uh, E. coli, um, uh, Pseudomonas, uh, obviously the fungal pathogens, but also more resistant pathogens and more hard to treat pathogens like Acinetobacter and Stenotrophomonas, Maltophilia. So um, yes, we see a distribution that we were not so surprised by, but there is a difference between those. And indeed, in many centers, you see resistant pathogens, MDR bacterial infections coming up. And these are data from an overview by Passero and many Italian studies in here. But generally, you see that the amount of MDR infections in these nosocomial infections are high, between 30 and even sometimes 100%. So it's something that really worries us. And that's, uh, that's a logical point of view. Now, um, what, what we were confronted with early in, in, in COVID, I think, and this has happened to all of us in 2020 when we first started, is that we mainly did empirical management of uh, respiratory bacteria infections in COVID because we, you know, we had pulmonologists that didn't want to really do bronchoscopy. Uh, we, we were afraid ourselves. Patients were often very, um, um, very sick. We didn't have the, the ways to do appropriate bronchoscopy guided management. But that empirical management really posed uh, a lot of, if you will, stewardship problems. We could actually treat um, uh, a pneumonia uh, that was not bacterial with uh, antibiotics that would then be unnecessary and potentially harmful for the patient. We could treat super infection with broad spective anti antibiotics while it's not necessary. We then have excessive antibiotic use. And we could also under treat, if you will, super infections by resistant bacteria or fungi. So I think it's important to mention that, um, and this is from the Pickens group, obviously, uh, that, uh, that the approach of doing bronchoscopy guided management gave us much more insight in the level of early super infection, as you see here uh, in the in the graph. 21% was actually shown in early, so within 48 hours, 
uh, performance of bronchoscopies uh, with culturing and then uh, later late super infections uh, the VAP uh, up to 44 percent so for up to 44 percent of um, patients get uh, a VAP over time so that's actually quite important and um, relevant as you can see here uh, yes there is a higher mortality in VAP patients in COVID as, as, com as compared to VAP without COVID. Now let's talk about bloodstream infections. I think this is a really nice study. I think you all have seen it, the Buetti study, actually investigating the risk of bloodstream infections, comparing this in a prospective matched case cohort study, a large ICU cohort in France. They compared COVID-19 critically ill patients, matched them with similar non-COVID patients and defined ICU bloodstream infections as an infection that occurred after 48 hours after ICU submission admission. Now, much difference, of course, between those patients, but interestingly also to see here at the red arrow, a lot of antibiotics are given. Almost 80% of patients with COVID admitted to ICU got antibiotics, irrespective of whether they were had an infection or not, but that's high. And what we saw, obviously, and you will have predicted that, that indeed in ICU blood, ICU bloodstream infections occur more, much more often in COVID-19 patients. As you can see here, 14.9 versus 4.3, 3.4%, match very relevant difference between those groups. And interestingly, also patients who then received, started on to receive tocilizumab or anakinra or sarilumab, um, they actually had a higher level of a, a higher um, um, uh, 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 risk ratio for getting um, uh, getting ICU bloodstream infections. Now, so that mean that 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 would give you graphs like this, like so the proportion of patients without bloodstream infections is actually in COVID very low. It's so like 40% does not get a bloodstream infection. So relevant aspects. So what are the, these pathogens? Mainly, and I think that's really striking, mainly coagulase negative staphylococci. Um, uh, uh, Enterococcus is quite common. Um, we've seen Candida, of course, not a subject today. What is also very relevant here is to see that the sort of, source of infection is very often not found. About 50% of patients, there's no source of infection found. So we have to really doubt or not doubt these data, but consider them critically and ask ourselves, is this really infection or is it in is it is it is it colonization? Is it um is it something that we uh, we should not take uh, uh, so seriously? So this is another study by Giacobbe, Italian study. This is a retrospective single center study, but actually shows the, shows the same results. The incidence rate of bloodstream infection increases over time in ICU, uh, gradually increases. And also here there's uh, especially the combination of um, uh, steroids and uh, um, IL-6 and anti-IL-6 agents uh, gives a larger uh, adjusted uh, hazard ratio. So yes, relevant to know that now, in, in now we use that very regularly, and it's likely that our infection, uh, bacterial infection rate uh, has, has risen. And this is a really nice study, just came out a couple of days ago, or I think last week, that shows temporal trends of blood culture, contamination, bloodstream infections, and ICO occupancy. And that this is a little bit what I'm, I was aiming at. As if you look at the, the lower graph, you can see that the, 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 the purple zone is actually where there was an increase in ICU occupancy by COVID-19 patients. So it's a sort of a population-like study. And as you see that rising, you also can see that, uh, yes, indeed, the red line rises, which are the bloodstream infection, but also the purple line, which is actually the blood culture contamination line is also going up. So we see a huge increase in blood stream infections, but we evidently also see there's a, as an increase in um, and con blood culture contaminations. And that also strikes remarkably well with the fact that we see a lot of uh, coagulase negative staphylococci in our blood cultures. Now, this is just our own data, just to show you that we've seen a huge swing in the development, in the, in the, in the development of CLOPSI in COVID patients. I think it's got to do with um, with the prone positioning, with the lack of hygiene that we 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 couldn't manage that that level quality of care, and uh, we have just seen a lot of increase in that. And obviously, those are very often caused by gram positive microorganisms like the CNSs. Now. First conclusions, co-infection in early COVID is probably rare, uh, especially when they're not admitted to ICU. Later on in ICU, it's more common, and especially late uh, in, in the course of treatment, we will see a lot of development of bacteria and fungal co-infections. 
often respiratory pathogens tend to be more uh, uh, multi uh, uh, multi drug resistant. Uh, but still, in bloodstream infections, the most common pathogens I've discussed, and likely there's a lot of contamination going on there. Immunomodulatory pre uh, treatment seems to be a major risk factor, and I believe that we see a lot of swinging uh, clopsy because of that, and also because of the fact that it's difficult to change lines, et cetera, et cetera, in patients uh, and, and, and take good care of lines in patients with COVID. But importantly, there's an abundant overuse. There seems to be an abundant overuse of antibiotics in ICU. Now, is that true? Is that really true? Uh, earlier on, again, these are this is a paper from 2020. Um, uh, it was done by a snapshot uh, survey. Do you prescribe antibiotics to all the patients with COVID-19 on the ward? Yes, that's definitely in, in a lot of countries that was a very high level. Um, uh, of course, we're now a bit further, uh, but this sort of showed that in the start, we didn't really know what to do. And we did treat a lot of patients from the start with antibiotics. Now, these are interesting data, and it's not ICU, but it's primary care. And actually, in primary care, we see the complete opposite. You can see here, over the time, uh, the uh, rate per 1,000 patient months uh, prescriptions uh, in males and female patients. And you can see that actually, uh, uh, especially in the lower age groups, like 5 to 14, there's a huge decrease in prescribing over the years. Uh, after the start of COVID. And here you can see it uh, in an age standardized rate. And you can see that from the start of COVID in England, these are UK data, there was a, 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 a much lower prescription rate than there was uh, uh, before. And these are Australian data, and it actually shows a, a striking drop in prescriptions. As you can see, there's a gradual discrete decrease in dispensing already going on over time uh, since 2016. But then in 2020, when COVID hits, there's a huge drop. And that is while still GP consultations, albeit online, were going on. So it's not only a question of not being confronted with the doctor, it also is just less prescriptions. Um, so, and these are data that just came out last week. And I think it's interesting to see that what, you know, what we expected, obviously, was that everybody would be prescribing a lot more. But you can see on the y-axis here that the difference in consumptions of antibacterials for systemic use, so these are in hospitals mainly, and on the x-axis, you can see it in the community. And actually, all of the countries that are represented here are in the left lower corner, which means that they have prescribed all, uh, uh, both less in the community and less in the hospitals. Only Bulgaria strikes, strikes the limit there on the right upper side where there's been more prescribing both in hospital and in community. So this doesn't really fit with the image we had from the start at least, and uh, I don't have data specifically on ICUs in Europe, but this is what we generally see in the population. So what will happen to AMR then? So this nice study by Dominique Monet and Stephen Harbert said, yeah, on one hand, you would say that we probably will prescribe more broad spectrum antibiotics. We have been using azithromycin quite a lot at the start. We all stopped with that now happily. Uh, and uh, infection control is difficult because the PPEs were not there or there was poor hand hygiene, there's overcrowding, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, there were also less bacterial infections in COVID and there was less elective surgery, so less complication, less patients with other diagnoses, less common infections uh, than we've seen earlier on. And also in the infection control, we believe that maybe by starting isolation and cohorting, we actually prevent nosocomial infection much more. So it looks at the moment like this is actually what is happening. So that COVID, all right, that's a difficult uh, thing to say, might have a little bit of a positive effect on the reduction on the, on the, on the level of antibiotic use. Now, what happened to stewardship activities? So this is a nice overview by Diana Shiro-Dope, who looked at all the kind of activities in the UK and saw that actually all AMS activities in hospitals, they just stopped. Essentially, the red lines are what all that that was reduced. So it, this is about performing a point prevalence study, about doing an audit, about doing OPAT, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing that really grew was the use of technology to facilitate stewardship. This is us on Zoom, right? There's more, there's been more education on Zoom, there's more feedback on Zoom. So that's what really worked. So it did change a lot, but uh, a lot of the general activities were uh, dismissed. Still, there was a lot of warning in the literature, in the press about 
hey, watch out, let's not neglect stewardship at this time. We're in COVID, it's a viral disease. That's really difficult, right? Um, um, uh, yes, of course, the typical history um, will bring you in the right direction, but also it's very difficult sometimes, especially when patients come to the hospital and have, have, um, uh, have, have symptoms, um, it, it can still overlap. So that is a tough thing to do. Other, on, the, on another note, um, when a patient's already in uh, hospital and in ICU, we have a lot of this diagnostic challenges during ICU stay, right? We know that patients who present first with COVID have rarely have bacterial infections, but we also know that secondary deterioration can be due to hyperinflammation or also by infection or by thromboembolism, or later on by fibrosis. And we know that in the pathology that COVID lung is combined vascular, fibrotic and epithelial damage is present. So there's, there's something of all, and it's very difficult to discern between those. I think that's a daily clinical observation we do. So that's why I really like this paper by Francois Adal, the very um, straightforward and um, and 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 you know, if you will, uh, um, um, nice evaluation of how we should actually challenge uh, how we how we should should approach this. And he actually says, or they say, um, yeah, it's very difficult to make a difference. There may be some indication that when you have the need for increased vasopressor infusion, so if you really have a hemodynamically unstable patient, that's the place where you should really watch out. There might be a bacterial co-infection going on. You need to probably look out for that or treat it. And another, I think, very important um, message here was, wait, if a patient is hemodynamically unstable, unsta then yes, you don't need to start treatment right away. You can wait for cultures. Uh, and I think it's important because that will limit maybe the use of, uh, um, you know, undisciplined use of antibiotics. Now, finally, I want to uh, finish with this. I know that um, 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 uh, that it's been discussed before, the use of PCT, and uh, uh, Pedro has uh, shown it a little bit, uh, or a little bit, a lot. What I want to show you is, is the way in which maybe if we don't have any clinical signs, could we then use PCT uh, to diagnose bacterial co-infection later, later on in the process? Well, as we know for influenza, this was actually quite a useful uh, uh, useful biomarker to use to, uh, to look for bacterial co-infection. And when we looked, uh, and these are data from our own center early in the, so this is in the first wave, right? So when we did not use any other drugs, just uh, um, uh, looked at BCT levels and CRP levels in patients that were admitted with COVID in ICU, we saw that, yes, BCT was relatively high, not terribly high, and went down over the time. This is the natural development. And then CRP, actually, we got quite some high CRPs, obviously, with a large um, uh, difference between patients, but still quite large and going down over time, as you can see here. Now, what we saw is that we looked at all the secondary infections and uh, that were diagnosed during ICU stay, and we looked at the, the timing of the secondary infection and what PCT did at that time when we uh, performed uh, PCT on a daily basis. And we saw that uh, here that actually uh, the occurrence of a secondary infection could quite well be, um, uh, um, be explained by, uh, by an increase in PCT and to a lesser extent also into CRP because it would purely viral infections and then a nosocomial bacterial infection could then be recognized. And here you can see the areas under the curve. Um, and they were not so bad, actually. And uh, as a matter of fact, we started to use a rule in our own hospitals when we said, yes, please do a PCT and follow it up every 48 hours. When PCT is above one, you can rule in infection. When it's lower than 0 0.25, you can rule out infection with a relatively good uh, 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 predictability. So this was actually what we did uh, at the start. Um, and But then obviously the second wave came, we started using dexamethasone and tocilizumab and serolimab. So we repeated the study at that time, and this is data from earlier this year. And as you can see on the lower graph, um, uh, you see that the whole effect of, um, of uh, actually the whole distribution of the um, of the biomarkers has been dampened by the use of docilizumab and, uh, and dexamethasone. So on the gray, you can see the background of the first wave. Uh, this is completely actually gone in the second wave. 
Uh, so no way that uh, it could actually still have a predictive value. And here you can see the errors on the curve that yes, indeed, as you can see, don't add much. So yes, unfortunately, this treatment reduces the value of CRP and procalcitonin to de detect secondary bacterial infections in COVID. What we do see now is that after dosolizumab has uh, done its job three weeks later, we see that uh, PCTs and CRPs are rising. So we're currently looking at that group to see if we could still have um, the effect of PCT on prediction of uh, bacterial infections later on in the course of COVID. Now, concluding, um, during the first wave, we used a lot of antibiotics in ICU, I think, and probably much higher than needed. And uh, we saw that COVID-19 had a really negative impact on hospital AMS activities. It remains a very difficult question to, to understand when to treat and who to treat. Um, yes, PCT may not add at the moment. Uh, we have to get, uh, we have to keep this as a clinical question where we, um, well, we, well we, we think of many different reasons and then decide, uh, preferably based on the use of microbiological tests before starting antibiotics. And I would highly recommend to prioritize BAL uh, to, uh, to, to get good samples and, 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 and really diagnose a proper infection before starting therapy. For secondary infections, indeed, general principles of MS still continue to apply. That's what I want to finish off with. Just one final note. There's a new course on ESSICAM on antimicrobial stewardship in ICU, a quality improvement program. You're all welcome to join that program. It's for free, uh, even for non-ESSICAM members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Great talk, great talk. You highlighted the... Uh, all uh, the things that uh, are the challenges with that we face every day in the ICU. And it was great uh, that, that you clarified the difference of co-infection, super-infection, the challenges, what kind of, is it the cap from SARS? Is it something else? And uh, with VAP, it, it is, you, you, don't know, you don't know, it's, it's uh, very difficult uh, yeah. to, to tell. And about uh, um, the, the contaminations, we face the same, a great amount of uh, um, flora from uh, the skin. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Good we luck with the rest of the day. Thank you. We move on now uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Hafiz Abdulaziz. I have uh, the pleasure to introduce uh, Hafiz that uh, used to be in a uh, in the same, working in the same center some years ago. Uh, Hafiz is a clinical pharmacist, he is a research fellow in the Center of Excellence Reduce, led by Professor Jason Robert, uh, he of the University of Queensland. He is a, a, doing a lot of work in uh, uh, TDM, uh, in uh, dose optimization, and um, he's the current chair of the working group that organizes uh, the webinar, the working group on uh, infection in the ICU and sepsis. Uh, he's gonna uh, talk about therape therapeutic drug monitoring and uh, antibiotic optimization in the ICU. Uh, welcome, Hafiz. Uh, thank you, Despina. Thank you for organizing this uh, nice uh, webinar. So uh, the title of my uh, topic today is uh, TDM in critical care. Uh, so TDM in the ICU, it's a uh, rapidly evolving field. Uh, so basically any drug uh, can benefit from, uh, from TDM if they fulfill some uh, criteria. So uh, some basic principles of uh, therapeutic drug monitoring or TDM is uh, for a drug which uh, demonstrate uh, significant PK variability or pharmacokinetic variability. So uh, that drug has a defined exposure range where you can link the concentration uh, with the pharmacological response, i.e. Uh, toxicity or clinical response uh, like cure. Uh, clinical cure, you have defined sampling time points, 
and you have assay to uh, accurately measure the drug concentrations. So uh, some important questions here. So uh, what we need to think is whether our current dosing regimen is uh, appropriate for all patients. Are they optimized for all patients? And what about critically ill patients in the ICU? Are we uh, giving the right uh, dosing regimens for this patient population? So um, a lot of uh, our dosing, uh, antibiotic doses, uh, so they come from uh, in vitro or animal uh, models, and uh, they are uh, scaled to a human use, and then they are uh, used for our very sick patients. So there are uh, important uh, physiological difference between healthy volunteers and also our sick uh, our sick uh, sick patients. So uh, uh, there. Uh, so it's highly likely that we are not giving the right uh, antibiotic dosing regimen for our very sick patients. So uh, this is an interesting study from uh, Goncalves, Pereira, and Povova. So they reviewed uh, six beta-lactam antibiotics. And what they found is uh, really interesting where they found that a uh, large uh, variability or large difference between uh, antibiotic volume of distribution and uh, clearance uh, for these antibiotics. So when we talk about PK, the two most important PK parameters are volume of distribution and clearance because these parameters influence uh, our dosing regimens. So if we, if, if we are dosing... Uh, uh, based on healthy volunteers' PK data, uh, it is highly likely that our current dosing regimen uh, leads to therapeutic failure or suboptimal clinical response. And uh, uh, as we all know, in the uh, ICU population, we have patients with renal or uh, liver failure, uh, obese patients, and some of these patients, uh, they receive uh, extra corporeal therapy such as uh, renal replacement therapy and uh, or maybe ECMO. So further complicating um, uh, antibiotic uh, dosing for these patients. Uh, so I would like to highlight the uh, some lessons that we can uh, get from the DALI study. So the DALI study uh, enrolled 361 patients uh, across 68 ICUs across Europe. So essentially what this study showed is a uh, huge variability uh, from uh, common antibiotic dosing. So as you can, uh, uh, as you can see here, some patients uh, demonstrated high dosing, uh, high concentrations, and some patients demonstrated low concentrations despite uh, using um, uh, very similar antibiotic uh, uh, doses. So uh, conventional beta-lactam dosing in ICU uh, in this study leads to 500-fold in concentration variation. And they tested uh, two PKPD targets. Uh, as we know, for beta-lactam, it's time above MIC. So they tested one time above MIC and uh, four times above MIC. And one time above MIC is the uh, conservative PKPD target. And even with a conservative PKPD target, 20% didn't achieve uh, this target. And among these patients, 32% uh, uh, demonstrated negative outcomes. So it's, uh, it's just to, uh, to show that our current dosing regimens are likely not optimized for uh, ICU patients. So this is uh, from the SMART study, uh, sampling of antimicrobial in renal replacement therapy study. So uh, this study recruited 381 patients across 29 ICUs from, uh, again, large um, number of countries. So what we can see here is uh, because uh, wide variation in uh, the dosing use and the RRT dosing use, so uh, this led to uh, variability in the trough concentration of uh, the beta lactams and also vancomycin uh, yeah, used. And this um, uh, suboptimal PKPD target, so although this is not the, 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 the main uh, aim of this study, so uh, 
uh, suboptimal PKPD target uh, led to higher mortality uh, in uh, this uh, patient population. So this essentially, again, uh, shows that uh, achieving optimal antibody exposures is really, really difficult uh, in the ICU. So key message number one, optimal drug exposure unlikely in patients with uh, altered PK and pathogens with uh, decreased susceptibility. And our current dosing in the ICU is highly suboptimal and uh, alternative dosing strategies um, are needed for our, our ICU patients. So what we, uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, use unit uh, level, introduce unit level intervention uh, such as using prolonged infusion and uh, continuous infusion. Uh, we could also use uh, dosing nomograms. We could also use dosing software, or we could also use um, apply therapeutic drug monitoring. So uh, we measure concentration, and based on this concentration, we um, alter our antibiotic dosing. So TDM is the only safest and effective way to ensure optimal dosing for ICU patients. So uh, based on antibiotic pharmacodynamics, um, we have a few in, uh, indices which, uh, which have been associated with uh, maximal killing activity. So uh, it's, uh, for example, time above MIC, CMAX above MIC, or AUC above MIC. So we are going to use this uh, indices uh, with uh, its uh, exposures to um, adjust or uh, optimize our uh, dosing for uh, patients. So uh, what we can see here is the uh, magnitudes of uh, exposures uh, uh, according to uh, antibiotic uh, PD or pharmacodynamics. So uh, this here is uh, from preclinical studies. And this here is the exposures um, uh, described from clinical studies. So what we can see here is uh, sometimes uh, from clinical studies, we uh, can see that the exposures needed are actually higher than what have been described in uh, the preclinical data. So the problem is when we are trying to achieve these uh, exposures using dosing that ha uh, has been uh, developed based on this, uh, these exposures. So uh, for some antibiotics, I, uh, I could say for most antibiotics, we have uh, exposures that we can link with uh, efficacy and uh, toxicity. And this can be used in um, our TDM program. Uh, but as you can see here, as uh, we will go uh, and see uh, in, our, uh, in, in the next uh, few slides that uh, for some antibiotics, we have um, for some uh, antifungals, for example, and also antiviral. So the relationship, the PKPD relationship is still unclear and the exposures or uh, the target that we can use to optimize uh, these drugs during therapy um, is uh, essentially uh, minimal. So it's still, uh, it's just to say that we need more data for uh, antimicrobials and for other drugs uh, to, 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 uh, to, to be used in uh, our TDM program. So key message number two, uh, for most antibiotics and some antifungals, we have clear exposure effect relationship uh, that we can use in our uh, TDM program. Uh, but uh, for antivirals, uh, uh, unclear or less data uh, have been uh, described for this uh, agents. So for sampling time points, uh, so the easiest and the traditional method is uh, to use semen or trough concentrations. So this uh, concentration provides information on drug clearance. For example, if we are performing uh, beta-lactam TDM and uh, we are aiming for 100 100% uh, of time above MIC. So trough concentration is the most uh, suitable time point that we can apply for TDM. And we could also use uh, the uh, a limited sampling uh, strategy. So a limited sampling strategy is uh, essentially using the most uh, informative time points, uh, sampling time points uh, 
uh, that can describe drug uh, pharmacokinetics and uh, exposure uh, essentially means the AUC. So basically, we can have between uh, uh, one or three or four sampling time points. And, um, and this uh, strategy, this uh, limited sampling strategy, as uh, I have presented here, is uh, quite commonly being used uh, for, for uh, fluoroquinolone CDM uh, for tuberculosis patients. Uh, so for continuous infusion, uh, you can sampling at any time point uh, of time. Uh, so these are some of uh, uh, the suggested uh, TDM sampling time points and targets for critically ill patients. Uh, um, yeah, uh, as you can see, uh, it's just the same with the PKPD target. Uh, we have uh, a lot of data for antimicrobials, but not so much on antifungals and uh, uh, for antivirals. So uh, the most important thing here is uh, achieving the concentration or exposure is not the goal of therapy. It's just a uh, means of uh, achieving PKPD target which would highly likely lead to a uh, clinical cure. So uh, the main objective is still uh, achieving uh, the uh, clinic, uh, positive response for our patients. So uh, four assays to measure the concentration uh, of uh, antibiotics. Um, so the method uh, ideally should be precise, accurate and highly selective. So we have uh, several uh, H, uh, HPLC or L LCMS methods uh, to do this. And ideally, it should be available uh, in a timely manner, uh, maybe less than uh, eight hours within the same day of uh, sampling. So ideally, we would want uh, free concentrations because that's the active um, uh, that contributes to the uh, activity uh, of uh, the antibiotic. But most uh, data that we have uh, linking exposures and clinical outcome, so they describe or used uh, total drug concentrations. Uh, and like these two studies that uh, I have here on this slide, so ideally we would want uh, a method that can simultaneously determine or measure the concentration of uh, uh, multiple uh, antimicrobials. And we also have uh, some new or alternative sampling uh, strategies uh, being currently investigated, like uh, dry blood spots or VAMs. So key message three is uh, sampling depends on our TDM targets. Uh, so we need more data on uh, limited sampling strategy and uh, the uh, method, the uh, assay method should be highly uh, selective uh, with rapid turnaround time. So how common is uh, TDM in ICU uh, now? So uh, I would like to highlight the uh, admin ICU survey. So this survey, uh, this, this survey, um, so it involves 402 uh, professionals from a uh, large number of uh, hospitals uh, and countries. So it involves uh, about 78% of ICU specialists, pharmacists, and uh, doctors in training. So uh, it is expected that these two drugs uh, commonly uh, are being uh, included in the, the TDM service and for beta lactam, uh, it's less than 10%. And what they uh, describe in this survey is uh, the practice, the TDM practice is highly variable. So it shows that uh, we need more evidence uh, for global practice shift towards uh, TDM to support uh, TDM. So benefits of uh, TDM. So almost always, if we talk about TDM, we always uh, mention this study, uh, the study by Len Evers um, and colleagues. So this is a multi-center study uh, which was conducted in Holland. Uh, so they studied patients with uh, gram-negative infections. So they com compared uh, TDM-guided dosing versus conventional uh, aminoglycoside dosing. So uh, uh, essentially what they uh, reported is uh, with uh, non-guided uh, 
uh, with a conventional dosing. So this group of patients require uh, more frequent dosing changes. And uh, in the TDM group, uh, significant benefits uh, that were reported uh, in this uh, patient group is um, reduced length of stay and uh, shorter duration of therapy, cost savings, and uh, left, uh, less nephrotoxicity. And we also have uh, one uh, for voriconazole comparing TDM versus uh, non-TDM and also uh, rebavirin uh, currently. And uh, key message for this uh, section is uh, practice. The TDM practice across ICUs are highly variable. Uh, TDM best for PKPD target attainment, but for clinical outcomes, clinical cure and mortality. So we need more data to uh, document this, uh, to support TDM, uh, uh, routine TDM in the ICU. And uh, so with TDM, it's always uh, uh, with uh, your available resource. So uh, if your centers uh, ha uh, have all the capacity or all the capability to uh, perform TDM, then uh, so TDM might be a good uh, strategy to optimize uh, antibiotic dosing uh, at your center. So we have uh, several uh, currently uh, ongoing uh, studies uh, uh, which compare uh, TDM versus uh, non-TDM. Uh, the first one is the target study. So this is a multi-center uh, RCT conducted in uh, Germany, uh, which involves uh, uh, patients with uh, sep uh, sepsis or septic shock. So they uh, use an aggressive PKPD target uh, as the target, as the TDM target for uh, in this study. And we also have the Dolphin uh, study, which is also a multi-center RCT. Uh, it's uh, from Holland, uh, involves 450 ICU patients, so beta lactams and fluoroquinolones are involved. And um, so the outcome that they are investigating is the um, is ICU length of stay. So it's really interesting to uh, wait for the, uh, the final results uh, for this uh, two um, large uh, RCTs. And we also have, uh, when we have, uh, population PK model for an antibiotic, we can incorporate other model uh, into a dosing software. And uh, these are some of the common uh, dosing software. Best dose is quite common, IDODS and DOSME. Uh, so these have been used in uh, clinical uh, practice in some centers. So we can include the sources for PK variability, the concentration variability. Uh, for example, body weight, uh, renal function, sickness severity, and based on these uh, parameters, so we can have uh, an accurate prediction um, for that patient uh, with regards to uh, the dosing requirements to, to guide um, our therapy. So that's, that's uh, is, uh, apart from TDM, this is also another interesting uh, approach or strategy that uh, we must uh, investigate further to uh, incorporate in our uh, clinical practice. So to conclude, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring assures that the PKPD target is achieved. Uh, so hopefully this will lead to uh, favorable clinical outcomes. Uh, TDM as a standard of care, ideally yes, but it depends on competing resources. And uh, finally, we need more clinical data to uh, support TDM, routine TDM uh, in the ICU. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Hafiz, thank you very much for uh, your talk. Very uh, interesting and important information. You highlighted uh, how we could optimize uh, the dosing at the uh, very important, especially for pathogen with increasing MICs. Hopefully we're gonna have more uh, results in the future as you, as you emphasized. And thank you for all the work that you are doing in your group uh, to help uh, intensivists in their work. It's, it's very difficult uh, to 
to handle dosing in uh, critically ill patients. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Despina. Thank you. And uh, with uh, this uh, talk, uh, Hafiz's talk, uh, we conclude the second uh, session, block of session. Uh, we have two questions for uh, Dr. Povoa. Is uh, Professor Povoa here? Uh, if he's not here, I can um, uh, read the question and the answer. Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm here. Okay, thank you, Pedro. So the first question uh, was... Can, uh, can I depend uh, upon CRP levels to choose appropriate antibiotic therapy from Antonio Shaker? Perfect. Can I just start? Yeah. So uh, the, 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 if, if I can depend on CRP levels to choose antibiotic, appropriate antibiotic therapy, my, the answer is no. You cannot choose antibiotics on the CRP levels. And appropriate antibiotic therapy is a microbiologic concept. However, if you have an appropriate antibiotic therapy versus inappropriate, the levels of CRP and other biomarkers who change differently. So if you have a marked decrease in uh, CRP or other biomarker after starting an empiric antibiotic therapy, the probability of having appropriate antibiotic therapy is much higher. And uh, if at the same time, the patient is also clinically improving with the, uh, like um, assessing the SOFA score, the probability of that is even higher. And there are some observational studies and also some randomized controlled trials showing that the, 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 the relationship between the appropriateness of antibiotic therapy and the, the relative decrease in CRP ratio, and this is also related to outcomes. But again, more than that, maybe if, if the patient is improving, it's okay. But the biomarkers are more, maybe more helpful to signal patients that are not improving. So if it, the, the biomarker is not decreasing, the patient is not improving, you should look, reassess the patient, look at the dosing of antibiotics, if there is a septic complication, if the, the diagnosis is wrong, and so it was not, it's a, a, something that is mimicking infection. So we have to check everything and so do not rely only on the number. That's, I think, the main message. There is one more question for you, Pedro. It okay. is from Hiba Baliad Bakir. It says, what the rules and function of PCT? Uh, there's no, no, uh, you should not use definite rules for PCT or any other biomarker. Just is a, something that you can use in addition to your clinical evaluation. Again, you should know everything about the biomarker, biology, strengths, limitations. And uh, as uh, 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 Giron uh, showed very well in his presentation, there are lots of things that can interfere in the biomarkers. In CRP, we already know that if you give an IL-6 inhibitor, since its synthesis is dependent on IL-6, if you give an IL-6 inhibitor, is the same as having an acute liver failure. So the liver do not produce CRP, CRP just disappear, and IL-6 goes very high. That's something that happens when you give that kind of drugs. For, for um, PCT, it disappears because it has a lot of influence of um, immunosuppression. There are several papers showing that, not only related to IL-6 inhibitors, but there are other confounders, like if a patient has a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, since it is a small molecule, it increases, which we studied in our COVID-19 patients, Comparing patients without renal failure and with renal failure, the levels of PCT were three times higher, independent of having or not um, an infectious 
uh, and with CRP, that 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 uh, difference is not that high. So there are no definite rules. And better that looking at a single value, look at the trend and the kinetics of a biomarker if it is increasing or decreasing, or if it is stable, and use that looking at the patient if the patient is improving or not improving. Do not rely only in a single number. I think that's something that. Uh, uh, almost always is associated with higher antibiotic consumption. There are I showed that that uh, recent trial, but there are more data showing that if you rely only on um, on on a biomarker or a number, you end up using more antibiotics. Thank you, Pedro, for staying and addressing uh, the questions. Uh, there is another question. Uh, before we do uh, the short break, I would like to um, inform the audience about something practical. A certificate, certificate of attendance is provided if um, the attendance, um, they are uh, in the webinar for more than 75% of the time. So towards the end of the a third block of session, they could download the certificate. Uh, they, there is an icon on the uh, right hand side, uh, cert, and uh, they can download it from there. Uh, they can, if they have any problem, they can use the chat and inform um, Delta Communications and uh, they will get help from there. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have a, a short break now. Thank you. And uh, we will uh, meet again in uh, uh, less than 10 minutes, in around uh, seven minutes. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to uh, the third block of session of this uh, Isaac webinar. Our next speaker is Professor Ardwan Rokigi, uh, intensivist uh, in the ICU of uh, University Hospital of Nantes, and also he has a dual appointment in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. He's leading um, a, a lab uh, working on uh, uh, development of transla transnational research on immunology. And uh, he's going to discuss uh, the host-targeted immunotherapies. Uh, thank you, Antoine, for accepting the invitation. Okay. Hello to everyone. Thank you, Despoina and the organization for the invitation. I'm pleased to talk about host targeted immunotherapies in the ICU. So I will not talk about COVID uh, uh, and immune therapies against COVID because there are some other talk on this topic. So here are my conflict of interest. And regarding the need uh, for non-antibiotic approaches to improve the outcome of septic patients, the first question is, do we really need some non-antibiotic approaches? So I will mainly use the example of hospital acquired pneumonia because it's my topic of research and it's a, a very high uh, medical burden in the intensive care units. So if you look at the recent studies uh, investigating new antibiotics or uh, the uh, adherence and compliance to uh, international recommendation for the prevention and treatment of pneumonia, and you look at the primary outcomes, yeah, uh, the Repshove study uh, compares ceftazidim avibactam versus meropenem for the treatment of pneumonia, and you look at the primary outcome, which is a clinical cure at the end of treatments, you can see that only 70% of the patients are cured, meaning that 30% of the patients are not cured, or there is a treatment failure in one patient out of three when you treat with antibiotics only. It's the same year in the French study, published this year in CID, where you can see that only 25 to 30% of the patients' compliance uh, to the recommendations are cured, uh, are cured at the end of the treatment. So yes, we definitely need some non-antibiotic approaches to improve outcome of septic patients. But a lot of approaches can be proposed. And if we return to the international definition of sepsis, 
which is sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection, it makes sense to consider that the targeting immune system and developing immunotherapy is a, 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 an asset uh, to improve outcome of septic patients. A lot of studies has been developed in the last 10 to 20 years to understand better the way the immune system coped with sepsis. So you can see this nice picture. I think we all know this kind of picture showing that you can have an hyperinflammatory response or immunosuppressions uh, associated with uh, modes, death or hospital acquired infections. A lot of cells can be in this, in, in, uh, involved in the immune defects such as macrophages, direct cells, natural killer cells, T cells, and so on. So I will not describe all these cells and say that we can target each one specifically. I will try to give you a rough and gross picture of how we can develop immune therapies and already use them nowadays. So the first thing is to consider that it's critical to differentiate infections of a sterile tissue from mucosal infections. If you want to develop immunotherapies, it's not the same to treat meningitis or septicemia, which are the presence of pathogen in a sterile tissue, from pneumonia, which is a mucosal infection, because in the respiratory uh, tracts or in the gut tracts for colitis, you already have some bacteria, and the immune system has to deal differently with these two conditions. So if we consider that mucosal infections are specific and subset of, uh, of, of cause of sepsis, we now can describe the interaction between our microbiome or the flora and the bacteria we have on the skin, on the gut, on the lungs, and our immune systems. And if you are healthy, while you are listening to me, uh, it means that you are living in symbiosis with your flora. And now we can just this consider that when you are suffering from pneumonia or colitis, it's a case of dysbiosis, meaning that uh, you don't, uh, you are not living anymore in good health and in, uh, with a good balance with your microbiome. These two considerations are critical because if you understand that your immune system is actively tolerating your microbiomes, and uh, it's not the same in the blood or in, in the meningitis. So we need to consider the microbiome as a, a part of the immune system because microbiome and all the bacteria we are carrying in the lung, in the gut, in the skins are teaching and are changing the way our immune system copes with sepsis. In this mice model, the authors compare the immune system composition of mice uh, without any uh, pathogen, germ-free mice, basically, with mice colonized with microbiome. And you can see here the maturation of the systems and when you induce uh, colonization with non-pathogen bacteria, the immune system becomes fully mature and starts to look like to a, a fully mature and functional adult immune system. So it's nicely show that you need to have an uh, some microbiomes to have a, a functional immune system. Uh, it can be described and supposed and demonstrated in vivo in humans by this kind of studies performed in cancer patients. So here, the authors compare the uh, survival curves of patients with lung cancer treated with anti-PD-1 treatment. So these treatments boost T cells against cancer. And you can see that in these two types of cancer, the red line is not very good. People are dying quickly, and it's better to be on the black line. The only difference is between these two populations is the, risk, the treatment with antibiotics, amoxicillin plus acid clavulinic that patients have received for uh, intercurrent infections. So these studies published in science two years ago show that when you use antibiotics, you change completely the way your immune system will deal with cancer. And in this study, the author has shown that this effect of antibiotics is uh, induced by the modulations of the gut microbiota with the, the eliminations of archaemantia, for instance. So we first need to understand that if you want to treat and modulate the immune system of your, part of your patients, you need to respect and protect their microbiome because our immune system is always in interactions with this uh, commensal flora. These pathogens uh, and this uh, commensal bacteria are producing some short fatty acid or vitamin, which are critical for the uh, good functioning of direct cells, macrophages, and K cells. And if you have a patient suffering from infection, the one you want to treat with uh, immune therapies on top 
of antibiotics. Uh, now you are in this status of uh, dysbiosis when your immune system is not able to receive the mediators and the uh, metabolite derived from the microbiota. So we definitely need to better understand the way the immune system uh, coped with the microbiome before and during uh, the infections. And so hospital acquired pneumonia is a very good setting to understand that because we have the patient before, during, and after the infections. So we performed several studies to look at some specific functions. And here are just two examples of what happened in our patients and in my models. If you look at the capacity of dendritic cells to produce interleukin-12, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, necessary to the activation of T cells during infections. You can see that in ICU patients hospitalized for uh, brain injuries, the capacity of the dendritic cells to produce interleukin-12 is decreased from day two to day 10 at the time of developing hospital acquired pneumonia. And we have been able to reproduce this kind of results in mice models. And we know that IL-12, one of the main functions of IL-12 is to induce the production of interferon gamma production by natural killer cells. Interferon gamma will enable the neutrophiles to be recruited to the lung tissue during pneumonia. And we show here in this study that patients hospitalized are still responsive to IL-12, but uh, without IL-12, the production of interferon gamma by NK cells is decreased at day one as compared to what's happened in LC controls. So before and during hospital acquired pneumonia, we have a decreased uh, a dysfunctional loop between the IL-12 interferon gamma and control of bacteria. So other cells are quite, quite important in the response to pneumonia, for instance. Alveolar macrophages are, con are continuously patrolling uh, airways to uh, control the respiratory microbiome and doing phagocytosis. So here you can see that it's possible to assess in vivo the phagocytosis of bacteria by alveolar macrophages. And during hospital acquired pneumonia, this phagocytosis is drastically decreased as compared to what happens uh, in normal conditions. We have been able to understand better the way this uh, defect in phagocytosis develops. It's notably by the uh, stimulation of uh, an inhibitory receptor, which is SIRP alpha. And if you treat uh, monocyte from uh, trauma or septic patients in ICU with this blocking SIRP alpha antibody, for instance, you are able to restore partially the phagocytosis of extracellular bacteria. So as a summary, you can try to understand and, and, and uh, better uh, uh, describe new treatments uh, for immune therapies uh, for each specific infection. And, but in my opinions, uh, these kind of approaches, which I have underlined in pneumonia, will not necessarily be useful to treat septicemia or meningitis. So we need more work uh, at the bench and at the labs. But now what can immunotherapies currently afford to clinicians? Because we do have patients. So if you accept the concept of the dysbiosis, as I just present, you need to consider that, for instance, pneumonia is no more only a matter of the presence or absence of a pathogen in the lungs. And in these settings, you will just try to eliminate the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for instance. But now if you think that you, the aim of the treatment is to restore symbiosis, you understand that you are not supposed to only try to eradicate the pathogen, but you need to restore the full function of the immune system and a, a, a happy microbiome. So one of the main and the oldest way to uh, treat infection is to restore uh, the microbiome diversity. So it has never been really performed in the lung, but it, uh, it's regularly now performed in the gut of our patients. For instance, if you are doing some microbiota transplantations, you can treat uh, and prevent uh, the severity of Clostridium difficile colitis, so it's well known. And, we, and some studies have also described that this uh, uh, increasing the diversity of the microbiome uh, is able to reduce inflammation in the gut of patients with ulcerative colitis or rectocolitis uh, hemorrhagic. So uh, the, the protection of the microbiome is critical and it's, we, are, we should aim to uh, increase the diversity rather than uh, using antibiotics only. And it has been shown by this kind of studies when the authors perform the meta-analysis comparing all the studies uh, that had tested uh, hospital uh, antibiotics to hardship uh, approaches. So in these approaches, the aim of the author is to reduce the number of days of the patients are treated with antibiotics when it's not necessary. The idea, as you know, is to reduce the risk of bacterial emergence 
And the price that can be paid is a, 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 a delay in, in giving the antibiotics. And so we are all fear, we, we fear that the mortality of the patients can increase. But in this meta analysis regarding the effect of reducing antibiotics in ICU, in hospitalized patients, you can see that reducing antibiotics is associated with a reduction of mortality. So it's a nice demonstration that uh, the microbiome is very important to restore immune system because you can uh, increase your response to anti pd one increase your survival in ICU patients, and you can decrease gut uh, inflammatory response. So uh, the second thing is we are already using some steroids such as dexamethasone or hydrocortisone in septic shock for some of, some of the patients, uh, likely in the COVID-19 patients, uh, you, are, you are using dexamethasone. And we need to understand that dexamethasone is not an immunosuppressor, but is an immune uh, modulator. Uh, in this study published by K uh, 20 years ago, it was a randomized clinical trial where the patients received placebo or hydrocortisone during septic shock. And the author looked at some several markers of immune system activities, such as interferon gamma or IL-12. And you can see that the production of these two mediators are increased during the treatment with hydrocortisone showing that hydrocortisone is not only an immune suppressor, but an immune modulator during uh, sepsis. And so you are already performing some immune modulation by using steroids. We confirmed this kind of idea that steroids can boost the immune system or modulate it in a better way to prevent sepsis by showing in trauma patients in the uh, Hippolyte trials, in the uh, traumatic brain injury in the corti tissue trials or in major surgery in the uh, Pikeman trials that the prevention of hospital acquired infection by hydrocortisone or dexamethasone is efficient to reduce the risk of in-hospital acquired uh, infection. So the future is likely to uh, move towards uh, to more uh, sharp and uh, precise editing of the immune systems. So with the notably with Despoina, we are uh, coordinating uh, clinical trials testing interferon gamma for the prevention of hospital acquired pneumonia. So this is a, a multi-center randomized clinical trials. Uh, most of half of the patients have already been included, but uh, unfortunately, I do not have the results yet. So we see the, the kind of approaches we are uh, we are testing, and we are testing interferon gamma given all the results I show you regarding the, the basic and the science. But interferon gamma has been already used in ICU as rescue therapies uh, in, a, in a critical ill patient with uh, very difficult to treat infections. So for instance, uh, a, a, a multicenter cohort study by uh, Didier Payan reports the use of interferon gamma as a rescue therapies in more than 30 patients in ICU with uh, favorable outcomes with the treatment. So you can see here is a level of Achilladier expression and monocyte before and during the treatment with interferon gamma. So Achilladier expression is a marker of immune depression in ICU. So you can see that on these outcomes, the treatment with interferon gamma seems to have beneficial effect. And a recent case report with uh, the treatment of nocardiosis with uh, interferon gamma has been reported, uh, has been described in uh, Lancet infectious disease. Some other approaches are under, under, the, under the development, such as interleukin-7, which has been described as to uh, treat and reduce the risk of lymphopenia in our septic patients. And this randomized clinical trial is a phase two clinical trials with a small number of patients. Uh, only 17 patients have been treated with, inter with IL-7. You can see that the number of uh, blood leukocytes increased faster in patients receiving IL-7 than with placebo. And lymph lymphopenia has been described as a risk factor of uh, death and hospital acquired infections. So the, in this trial, uh, we have to notice that the mortality was slightly increased with the IL-7. So at this time, this treatment should not be used except in clinical trials. And you can see from this IL-7 trial that you can rest the immune system, but perhaps increase the risk of death. And it's because it's tricky to play with the immune system during sepsis. Here is why it, it's so tricky. You, you can see three lines, green, blue, and purple, showing three kinds of patients. In the green patients, you can see that you will remain in S, else, while the pathogen burden can become very huge. So this patient has, is highly tolerant to the pathogens. So you can give him a lot of pathogen, and he's not sick. Uh, 
In purples, it's the opposite. The patient will develop an immune system quickly, even if the pathogen burden is very slow. The green is very good if you are facing pathogen with a low virulence because the pathogen will not kill you. So you can accept to have a high burden of pathogens. Uh, the purple is, good, is not good if the pathogen are not has virulence. So you always need to try to understand where your patient stands and what is the danger he is facing. Because if you want to increase the immune system with IL-7 or interferon gamma in the purple patients, you will increase the, the, the severity and likely the deaths. But if you increase tolerance with hydrocortisone in patients with brain, you, you, uh, uh, you, you, you can expose the patients to uh, dangerous invasive pathogens. So as a summary, if you want to use uh, immune therapies in ICU, the first thing is to consider the site of the infection. You shouldn't only consider sepsis or no sepsis. You should uh, really understand if you want to have a sterilization of your system, uh, septicemia, meningitis, you need to eradicate all the pathogens. It's not the case for the gut or the lungs. You need to try to understand if you want to increase tolerance or immunity in your patients. So we will have to develop biomarkers for personalized decisions. And this biomarker needs to integrate the microbiome, the pathogen, and the immune systems to know if we are in the green line or in the purple line. And currently, as a rescue therapy, the only easily available treatment is interferon gamma, which can be used, and uh, its use has been described as rescue therapies in patients with protracted sepsis, such as pneumonia with a, a lot of recurrence or peritonitis with intra-abdominal abscess. Uh, so uh, case, uh, case report has been published, but there is no strong uh, randomized clinical trial yet to validate the use of uh, interferon gamma in this setting. And uh, I want to thank everyone uh, in my team and in the Hub2 project uh, regarding uh, the development of immune therapies in IC. Thank you. And Duan, thank you very much for your, thank you very much for your exceptional talk. It's uh, like uh, having a sneak peek in the future uh, where we're go gonna be able to hopefully to individualize, personalize the therapies. Thank you very much. We're gonna move uh, forward to our next uh, speaker, that is um, Evangelos Terpos. He's professor of hematology in the University of Athens, and also is the director of uh, the stem cell transplantation uh, uh, unit of the university. I'm Evangelos Terpos from the National Capodistrian University of Athens, and I would like to thank the organizing committee for the very kind invitation to present our data about COVID-19 hematologic malignants, and especially the effects of vaccination. These are my disclosures, are mainly due to my myeloma research and not because of this presentation. Hematological malignancy unfortunately, is a risk factor, an adverse risk factor for outcome in COVID-19. And you can see here that both adults and children may have an increased uh, mortality rate compared to controls. 34% of the adult patients with hematologic malignancies will die uh, if they are affected by COVID. And as you can see, patients above the age of 60 have a mortality rate of 47% uh, of more. Patients who are under treatment or recent anti-cancer treatment have a mortality rate of around 40%. Among hospitalized patients, you can see that patients with hematologic malignancies uh, and COVID-19 have almost double mortality rate compared to uh, other uh, patients with COVID-19. And as the age increased, you can see that patients with hematological cancers have very high uh, mortality rate that goes up to 60%. Another important issue is that patients with lymphoma and COVID-19 infections are more likely to have persistent COVID-19, and this is something that uh, plays an important role to their mortality rate. While treatment is another important factor that increases mortality in patients with hematologic malignancies, as you can see that patients who receive anti-cancer anti treatment within six months have higher mortality rates uh, compared to all the others. 
and especially the uh, type of uh, the anti-cancer therapy is of great importance. For example, the intensive uh, anti-cancer therapy that is given to our patient correlates with increased mortality rate compared to the non-intensive watch and wait or everyone else without hematologic malignancy, as you can see here. More specifically, uh, monoclonal antibodies targeting CT20 or uh, CT38 or uh, B cell maturating antigen that, uh, uh, let's say, kill all the lymphoma population correlates with a decreased overall survival and prolonged hospitality stay. COVID-19 also increased mortality in specific hematologic malignancies like in multiple myeloma. You can see the results of a study that was published in blood last uh, December from the International Myeloma Society suggesting that the COVID-19 has a mortality rate of 25% uh, in uh, the different countries going uh, from 26% in the United States to 59% in the United Kingdom or 38% in France. The increase of the age of myeloma patients correlates with higher mortality rate and also the presence of uh, uh, stage 3 compared to stage 1, uh, high risk cytogenetics, renal impairment or other comorbidities also correlates with higher mortality. Due to the high mortality rate, I think it is totally important that our patients to be vaccinated with the MRI vaccines that seems to be the most efficacious, although we have uh, the adenovirus vaccines that have been licensed by EMEA also. How can you measure the uh, antibody response? There are uh, some uh, uh, methods that have been uh, approved by the FDA uh, for the neutralizing antibody. Uh, the GenScript method uh, is the only one that has been uh, approved uh, by FDA. And this is what we are using. Uh, of course, uh, many uh, labs are using in-house uh, ELISA methodology, especially for, uh, for antibodies uh, versus the different variants. We do know that the antibody response after full vaccinations in patients with hematological malignancy is very low compared to healthy individuals or patients with solid tumor. And if we compare the different vaccines, we can see that uh, the Moderna vaccine seems to be more efficacious compared to the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca uh, shows the uh, lower efficacy in this cohort of patients. Regarding specific uh, hematological cancers, uh, from uh, uh, May 2021, we had the two first publications in blood in CLL by the Israeli group and in myeloma by our group, which showed that uh, patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia after full vaccination with the two dose, only 50% develop antibody against uh, the spike of, uh, uh, of the virus. While in our uh, paper, we had multiple myeloma patients uh, above the age of 80, because this was the first population that was vaccinated in Greece at that time, were octogenarians, and you can see that neutralizing antibody titers, more than 30%, developed with the first dose, only 25% of the patients, and only 10% uh, neutralizing antibody titers of more than 50%. We finished our study for the full vaccination and the results one month after uh, the first dose, and we published that in August in Blood Cancer Journal. You can see here uh, 213 patients with multiple myeloma. This is the result before the first dose. All of them were vaccinated with a Pfizer vaccine. The results after the uh, before the second dose and one month after the second dose. And here are the results of uh, controls of similar age and gender. And you can see that uh, approximately, as uh, you can see here, 30% uh, of 71% uh, or 30% of patients with multiple myeloma here uh, have not uh, developed neutralizing antibody uh, against uh, the virus. 30% of neutralizing activity is considered the positivity for the method. 50% is considered clinically relevant inhibition based on uh, macacus uh, uh, experiments and not in humans. But if we put the level in 50%, you can see that approximately 53% of the patients with myeloma managed to have this titer uh, compared to almost 85% uh, of uh, the individuals of similar age and gender. If we compare multiple myeloma patients with patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance as monitoring myeloma, myeloma that does not need therapy, you can see that patients with myeloma one month after uh, the full vaccination have lower antibody responses compared with the, uh, the precursor diseases.
Another interesting finding that uh, has just been published in the Journal of Hematology by my colleague Maria Gabriel is that patients with myeloma who had been infected by SARS-CoV-2 uh, have higher antibody responses four weeks after the diagnosis compared to patients of similar age and gender who were vaccinated uh, after two uh, doses of the vaccine of Pfizer four weeks after the full vaccination. Importantly, we've seen the anti-myeloma therapy seems to affect the response to vaccine, and especially anti-myeloma therapy with anti-CD38 or anti-BCMEA monoclonal antibodies, antibodies targeting uh, all the lymphoma population because the B-cell maturating antigen and the CD38 is uh, included in not only in plasma cells, but also in lymphocytes. So you can see that this cohort of patients one month after the full vaccinations have very low response and the multivariate analysis shows that the lymphopenia at the time of vaccination, the presence of uh, anti-BCMEA or anti-CD38 uh, uh, targeted therapies uh, correlates with very poor response to full vaccination. These results were further confirmed by the Mount Sinai group, which showed that uh, using, of course, not neutralizing antibodies, but uh, antibodies against the spike um, of the SARS-CoV-2, that 20.5% of patients who receive anti-CD38 uh, monoclonal antibodies and 42% who receive BCMA targeted therapies do not develop uh, IgG antibodies against the spike. And the multivariate analysis showed again that the lymphopenia, the response status after treatment and treatment with anti-BCMA or anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies correlates with poor response to full vaccination. Uh, in uh, the same um, uh, in the same, the same group uh, published very recently, and this was also an oral presentation of the International Myeloma Workshop in Vienna in September, that patients with myeloma who do not develop uh, antibodies with the red uh, uh, color have also very low T-cell responses uh, against the virus. And this was, as I pre uh, mentioned, uh, very uh, recently published. Importantly, patients with multiple myeloma who had uh, previously been infected with COVID-19 uh, had, uh, after the vaccination, had very high levels of antibodies against the spike protein that uh, persisted after six months uh, after the full vaccination, while all the others uh, had antibodies that reduced over time. And these are the healthy controls who were infected or non-infected by COVID-19 and were vaccinated fully with uh, the Pfizer vaccine. However, we have to mention that uh, all these uh, uh, tests are uh, targeted uh, either the spike or they are neutralizing uh, against uh, the Wuhan virus. And we do know that uh, this is from health individuals and this is from our group in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, George Torlakis group in the United States that uh, patients who develop neutralizing activity against uh, the Wuhan virus, although they neutralized similarly the alpha variant, you can see that there is uh, an around 40% of reduction in the neutralizing activity of uh, the Delta variant uh, 90 days, three months after the full vaccination. But if uh, we had uh, COVID-19 convalescent who were vaccinated, you can see that this neutralizing activity remains the same uh, against the Wuhan, the alpha or the Delta variant. In patients with lymphoma, and especially with lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, the results are even worse than myeloma. Uh, if they are vaccinated uh, with uh, the two Pfizer vaccine, one month after vaccination, patients with Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, as you can see here, almost half of them have um, um, very low uh, activity uh, against the virus compared to the normal controls. And other lymphomas, uh, including CLL patients, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma, also show low activity. Here you can see the results before the first, before the second dose and one month after the full vaccination compared to normal controls. You can see where are the normal, where the normal controls uh, are uh, achieving, uh, what they are achieving after the full vaccination compared to our patients. However, you can appreciate that there is a group of patients here who are doing very well. And when we checked uh, who are these patients, these are patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, 
while patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia are doing very uh, poorly. And this is because they are receiving therapies uh, with uh, rituximab, because even the presence of rituximab in the last 12 months uh, was an adverse prognostic factor in the multimorite analysis uh, for the production of neutralizing antibodies. Patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, as the Israeli group showed also, who received therapy, uh, responded to a vaccine, to the full vaccination, very poorly. Only 20% develop uh, uh, antibodies. And you can see here that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the neutralizing activity is very low. In general, patients who receive an autologous transplantation seems not to have any problems when they are uh, fully vaccinated, but patients who receive anti-CD38, anti-CD20, as I previously mentioned, or CAR-T therapies are uh, responding very poorly to the full vaccination. Can a third vaccine dose uh, be protective? And you are the first who see this uh, slide uh, because um, we have just um, uh, sent it to blood. We have 167 patients with multiple myeloma. You can see here the results of their full vaccination with the two doses uh, on day 50, is uh, one month after their full vaccination. And then uh, what happened uh, before the third dose? The third dose was given at the median of five months after their full vaccination. And here are the results after uh, the third dose, one month after the third dose. And the results are very good. Overall, as you can see here, 68% uh, of patients had uh, neutralizing activity below 50% uh, after, uh, before the third dose. And among them, 65% uh, showed NAP titers above 70%, uh, 50% at one month after the third dose. So they have clinically relevant inhibition. Even uh, if we check this cohort of patients who were 57, 34%, who had NAP titers below 30% on day 50, all of them presented also with NAP titers below 30% before the third dose. And you can see that 56% of them showed NAP titers more than 30% or 45% of NAP titers of more than 50% at one month after the boosted dose, suggesting that the boosted dose uh, offers very good results in a cohort of myeloma patients uh, who had not achieved with the two previous doses uh, good uh, uh, neutralizing activity uh, in more than uh, 40 to 50 percent. So in summary, the mortality due to COVID-19 is high in patients with hematologic malignancies and their active therapy especially. Patients with myeloma have low antibody responses, especially those under immunotherapy or targeted therapy against CD38 or BCMEA. Similarly, patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia and Hodgkin's lymphoma and Waldstrom macroglobulinemia have very low neutralizing antibody production while on treatment with IDCD20, especially. The T cell responses seem to be reduced in patients who do not develop antibodies and get SARS CoV 2 after full vaccinations. And I think the questions for the hematologist is what is the optimal time of immunization for our patients? What is the best uh, test for measuring antibodies and get SARS CoV 2? And what is the cutoff of the clinical significance? What is the solution for non responders? And a third vaccine sought? It seems yes for um, at least 50% uh, or even more uh, for our patients. So we have not to forget uh, that uh, the results that I have shown to you uh, target the Wuhan uh, um, uh, viral and not virus and not uh, any of the variants. So we expect that we have lower protection against uh, the uh, Delta variant or the Omicron that comes, but definitely uh, in those patients who do not develop antibodies, the third vaccine sort of offers in almost 50 or 60% of them uh, a good response. Monthly immunoglobulins against the SARS-CoV-2 may be a solution because the T-cell immunity in these patients is not enough to produce immunity against the SARS-CoV-2. And uh, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. And my, slide, uh, my last slide, I would like to thank all my colleagues uh, in the Department of Clinical Therapeutics, especially our mentor, Thanos Dimopoulos, uh, my colleague, Yanis Papasotiriou in Hagia Sophia Hospital for the measurement of uh, um, uh, antibodies against uh, the RBD of the uh, virus.
the Yanis Trugagos and his team for the measurement of neutralizing antibodies with uh, the commercial uh, method that I showed you previously, and uh, George Pavlakis and Barbara Ferber and their lab for, uh, uh, for, for the help that they gave us for the measurement of uh, the variant antibodies uh, that I showed you in the healthy population, and we now measure them in patients with multiple myeloma and other hair malignancies. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to have questions. I would like uh, to thank uh, Professor Terpos for the very interesting and useful data that he presented. And uh, I would like uh, to move on and welcome our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Conway Morris. Dr. Conway is a Marius clinician scientist of the University of Cambridge. Uh, he is a, a consultant and Andenbrook's ICU. Uh, he is uh, the current a chair of infection section of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. He's going to present VAPING COVID-19 patients. Andy, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and doing the presentation for this webinar. Okay, uh, thank you very much to Spoiner for the uh, kind introduction there. Um, as I say, my name is Andrew Conway Morris. I'm uh, an intensivist based in the University of Cambridge and at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Um, and I have a particular interest in ventilator associated pneumonia. So, uh, just to quickly say my conflicts of interest, I'm a member of a scientific advisory board for a startup company, um, and that is my only conflict. So what I thought I'd talk about today is a little bit about ventilator-associated pneumonia in general, uh, just as an introduction to the topic. Um, and then obviously onto the meat of the talk, which is talking about VAP in COVID. So how frequently do we see it? Perhaps why we see it um, so frequently? And with a particular focus on the organisms that cause it. And we will touch a bit on COVID-associated uh, pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, and then a little bit at the end, I'll talk about the approach to the diagnosis and management of ventilator associated pneumonia in COVID. And we'll talk a little bit about safe bronchoscopy in these patients and uh, how our experience has developed over the, uh, the last 18 months. So I'm sure to this audience, this is no great surprise, but it's just important to, to run through what it is so we're clear about what we're talking about. So ventilator associated pneumonia is pneumonia that's developing in a patient who's been ventilated for at least 48 hours. And it's classically caused by gram-negative or enteric organisms such as Pseudomonas, E. coli, Enterobacter, um, or amongst the gram-positive, Staph aureus is one of the commoner uh, bacterial organisms. And obviously the resistance profile of the organisms that you will see in VAT will depend on your local unit um, flora. So, what you will see will be consistent with the other bugs that you tend to see in, in your patients. The pathogenesis is reasonably well established in as much as we see microaspiration of these enteric and gram negative organisms that tend to colonize the oropharynx within 48 to 72 hours of the patient being admitted to ICU. They pool above the cuff and, and trickle down. Now, clearly, it's more complex than that. And Professor Roquilli gave a lovely talk earlier um, about the disruption of the microbiota and how pneumonia that we see, particularly in ventilated patients, is a form of dysbiosis. But there clearly is import of organisms from other parts of the body. And the risk factors that we're aware of for ventilator-associated pneumonia are, number one, being on a ventilator. And not just being on a ventilator, but being on a ventilator often need to be sedated because they're paralyzed and they're turned prone. They've certainly got lung inflammation and that will almost certainly lead to immunoparesis. And we know that ventilator associated pneumonia is a significant problem and is associated with an increased mortality. And I think the best estimate of that increase is around about 10 percent. So that's VAP in general. Um, let's just talk briefly about how we diagnose it, because this is something that can be problematic. Where we need to start is with a patient with pulmonary inflammation and impaired oxygenation. So to indicate that they have a, a lung focus problem, that's what we look for. So signs of, of one or other or both of those. 
And then we look for evidence of infection. And that's usually manifested as systemic inflammation. So elevated temperature or suppressed temperature, elevated white cells and neutrophil counts and so forth. So uh, we may also look at biomarkers such as the, the ones that um, Professor Povar mentioned earlier as well. If we've got a patient who has this feature, systemic inflammation, pulmonary inflammation, impaired oxygenation, we might want to go on and get a chest x-ray and look for radiographic infiltrates. Or if we're feeling uh, you know, more adventurous, we might want to do a CT scan to look for, for uh, specific lobar infiltrates. And these three together give us the sort of clinical picture of pneumonia. And that's not specific to ventilator-associated pneumonia, but, but to any pneumonia. But the problem is that they're not very specific because there are lots of things that can give you impaired oxygenation. There are lots of things in ICU that can give you systemic inflammation and radiographic infiltrates are also not particularly specific to infection. And of course, if we think about patients with COVID, well, they've got all of those already. So it does make it quite tricky. So what we need to really clinch the diagnosis of ventilator associated pneumonia is evidence of an, of an infecting organism. And in the case of a patient who's come in with a primary infectious pneumonia, such as a viral pneumonitis from COVID or influenza, or with a primary bacterial infection, we want to see evidence of another, an additional infecting organism in their lungs. And so I think COVID both presents challenges in as much as it is likely to produce a group of patients who are highly susceptible to VAP, but also provides a diagnostic challenge because it's difficult to spot the VAP amongst these patients. So what have we seen? What does the data tell us about VAP in COVID? Sorry, that's my little slides. So just to um, describe what's been going on in the UK, and I suspect not all that different from um, where uh, the audience are practicing as well, but we found that about 15% of patients who required ICU, sorry, who required hospitalization ended up being hospitalized. And even in a you know, reasonably uh, resource uh, flush area, such as the United Kingdom, only 4% of our acute hospital beds are ICU beds. So you can see already, there's clearly a mismatch between these two. Invasive ventilation was the commonest indication for admission to ICU, certainly during wave one. And during wave two, as we moved away a little bit from invasive ventilation for all our patients, we still were ventilating a lot of them. And so across the UK, we probably, this number will have changed a little bit recently, but probably we're ventilating between 40 to 60%, depending on the units, the vaccination status of the patients, and how rapidly we've managed to get in some of the immunomodulatory therapies that have been shown to improve outcomes. And the median duration of ventilation for patients who end up ventilating with COVID is around about 12 days. So we've got a group of patients here who are at high risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia. So do we have a problem? Well, there are a number of studies that have been published. This was one from our unit that I'll describe in a little bit more data, a little bit more detail. This is um, a multi-center study, uh, largely based in French units, but with representation across Portugal, Italy, and a number of other European countries. Um, and there have been a number of expert commentaries as well. And I think the, the without wanting to ruin the rest of my talk, but the take home message is, yes, VAP is a problem. And you probably guess that um, from uh, the way the talk's been going. So let's talk a little bit about what we've seen uh, in the hospital that I work in, uh, which is Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. Um, so we found is this was data from wave one. Um, we're just in the middle of processing the, the data from waves two and wave three. But we found that half of the patients who were ventilated for COVID, which was most of the patients we admitted to ICU, ended up developing a ventilator associated pneumonia. And that as I've mentioned already that there are problems with the diagnosis of that, but this was using the ECDC uh, definitions of clinical radiographic and microbiological confirmation. Uh, and so that gave us an incident density of 26 per thousand ventilator days, which is a, a pretty stunningly high number. Um, now, of course, it could be that the reason why we had such high levels was because the units were under high pressure. We were wearing sessional PPE um, and therefore weren't changing our gloves and gowns as well as we should do. Perhaps weren't doing the hand hygiene as well as we should do. Perhaps we were just transferring infection around the unit in these patients who were staying for a long period of time. So to control for that, we looked at patients who were in the unit over the same period of time under the same PPE conditions um, who didn't have COVID. 
And we found there that only 14% of them develop BAP, and that's 13 per 1,000 ventilator days. So, so a much lower incident density. And now, of course, incident density is imperfect because three patients staying for three days each would be counted the same as one patient staying for nine days. And yet, clearly, their VAP uh, risk is, is distinct. But if we do a survival analysis, we can see here, and that does adjust for that. So um, censoring for patients who are extubated and therefore can't get VAP, patients who die, unfortunately, can't get VAP. If we censor for those, we can see here with this survival curve, the patients with COVID have a significantly increased risk of VAP relative to patients in the same unit, staying for the length, same length of time, ventilated for the same length of time, but without COVID. So this suggests that not only is this a degree of COVID specificity to it, but also that it can't be explained just by unit factors. And when we had a look at the organisms um, that we found, you can see here, this is the organisms found in COVID and the organisms found in patients without COVID. You can see they're pretty similar, really, not an awful lot of differences between them. The one thing I would highlight is aspergillus, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, at, later on in the talk. So our conclusion from our unit, single centre study, was that we saw much more VAP in the patients with COVID-19 that wasn't fully explained by increased duration of ventilation or the PPE that we were using, but the, the organisms that caused it were the same old organisms as we saw in everybody else with VAP in our unit. Um, if we have a look at a multi-center study, what do we see? So, you know, obviously single center study, how generalizable is it? Well, this was a study um, that looked at um, data from, uh, I can't quite remember how many units it is, but it's a, a certainly a significant number of units, I think around 30 uh, from across Europe. Um, and it was a retrospective analysis, include patients from 2016 to 2019 who clearly didn't have COVID, and then a group of patients in 2020 who almost all had COVID. And they divided the patients into three groups. So those with COVID, those with influenza, and those with a non-viral um, They showed, similar to what we'd seen in, in Addenbrooke's, was that the incidence of VAP was significantly higher in those with COVID. Um, so 36% of those, a little bit lower than what we'd seen, but 36% of those uh, developed, COVID, developed VAP, whereas only 22% of the flu patients did and 16.5% of the non-viral patients. Interestingly, again, similar to what we'd seen in, in Addenbrooke's was that the microbial flora was very similar across these three groups, dominated by the sort of organisms you would expect. So the gram negatives, the pseudomonas, the enterobacter and so forth. Interestingly, they did find fewer multi-drug resistant organisms in the COVID patients. Um, that's not something that we'd noticed. Uh, and I don't entirely know how to interpret that at the moment, but it was an interesting finding. So what I thought I'd do now is just break up this presentation a little bit and tell you a story about a patient. So we had a patient uh, gentleman in his 60s, um, a fairly classic COVID patient who was obese, diabetic, hypertensive with chronic kidney disease and came in having had family contact with proven COVID-19 uh, with a pretty obvious presentation of COVID. He was hypoxic, required intubation and admission to ICU, and he was managed muscle relaxant, nebulized epiprostanol and proning. This was in wave one before the publication of the recovery trial. So this patient was uh, not randomized because he declined that previously and didn't receive steroids um, or any other immunomodulators. So this is his, uh, what we call a fever chart in, in Attenborough. So you can see here temperature along the top and you can see this sort of high swing temperature that was pretty classic for patients without immunomodulators with, uh, with COVID. Um, and we can see here, it didn't mount much of a white cell response, but it's CRP. And again, this is pre-tocilizumab day, so you can still use CRP. And you can see here, his CRP waxes and wanes. At this point here, he has a bronchoscopy. CRP recovers as we start some antibiotics and then goes up again. And again, at this point here, we do a second bronchoscopy and a CT of his chest. So what we found on the first BAL was normal mucosa. Aspergillus positive by PCR, and unfortunately, the sample got lost before they did the galactamanin. This was in the midst of wave one when the lab was under massive pressure. So it's not a, not a criticism of them. It's just the, the way things went. But we found a lot of stenotrophomonas, 
uh, on PCR, and we also found that by culture. So he was treated for um, stenotrophomonas multifilia for seven days. The aspergillus was thought probably to be a contaminant. Um, and obviously, septrin has a degree of antifungal cover, but it's not really your ideal choice for aspergillus. By the time we get to BAL2, there are obvious fungal plaques in his main stem bronchi. His aspergillus is positive by PCR, and his galactaman is borderline positive. It's above 0.5, but below 1. Um, and we attributed that to the, uh, to the septrin. And he went on to have a CT chest, which you can see here again. A fairly classic CT chest for somebody with COVID pneumonitis, a bit more consolidation down at the left base than one might expect, but no classic signs of aspergillosis. So did this patient have aspergillosis? Um, we think he probably did, and we treated him with an appropriate antifungal. He recovered and has made it home, and I still see him in the local area, which is nice. Um, the earliest report of COVID-associated aspergillosis came in the Blue Journal from Van Arkel, who'd suggested that there might be a rate of around 19%. That's quite a small study, um, but quite a high prevalence. And that was sort of similar to influenza-associated aspergillosis. In Cambridge, um, this is all of our data. It's the one bit of data I have managed to assemble across waves one to three. Um, we found that 8% of uh, 100 patients who we've investigated for VAP by bronchoscopy um, had aspergillosis, and that was 2.5% of all of our COVIDs admitted to ICU. So that includes ventilated and non-ventilated patients. So I'd say our experience is that the incidence is a little bit lower than might have been suggested in early things, but certainly not negligible and not a, uh, not a disease you could ignore. What about the rest of the literature? So this was a, a, another French study that was published very recently in uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine, where they did very detailed um, surveillance of patients for possible um, COVID. And they found that 15% of patients had what they call CAPA, covered associated pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, and if we look at the uh, survival curves for those patients, you can see that the patients with uh, probable or possible um, COVID associated aspergillosis did worse. So their mortality was significantly greater. So, and interestingly, in this study, they also looked at bacterial pneumonia and um, COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis was the only disease they'd identified that was associated with an increased mortality. So I think what we can conclude from this is that Kappa is a real thing, that we're definitely seeing it, that we're seeing it in multiple centers. It's not every patient with COVID and a secondary infection, but it's certainly a non-negligible proportion, probably somewhere between the order of you know, 10 to 15% of patients. And therefore it needs to be considered. And I think you certainly need to, to think about testing for Balgalactomannan, which is the most sensitive and specific test we have for aspergillosis in any patient who's got COVID on a ventilator, who's not getting better. So, just to sort of finally finish my talk, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, the use of bronchoscopy. I have a distinct memory at the beginning of, um, of the COVID uh, pandemic in, when it, and it hit the UK in March 2020. And we had a two on call system. One of us was on the unit and the other was on from home um, to provide backup and advice. And my colleague phoned me and said, I'm thinking about doing a bronchoscopy in this patient um, who's got COVID-19 you know, but I'm really scared about doing it. What do you think? And we talked around for about 20 minutes before deciding and balance that exposing ourselves to the risk of COVID at this stage um, was likely to take us out of action and cause more harm uh, than a bronchoscopy. But as we went through the first wave, we did notice more and more patients presenting with what appeared to be ventilator-associated pneumonia. We were concerned that using endotracheal aspirate may well be over-diagnosing. And as a unit, we tend to use bronchoscopic diagnosis for for VAP prior to COVID. And so we sat down and tried to work out a way that we could safely bronch our patients. And the system we've come up with is one where you minimize the circuit breaks, where you pause the ventilator to minimize aerosolization as you, as you break the circuit, um, that you don't cut the, um, uh, the membrane on your catheter mount. And you can see here this setup, which we've just tested on a, on a test lung on an anesthetic machine, um, We've closed the circuit and this is the balloon at 15 minutes. So there is minimal leak in this system. And we believe that if you combine that with, um, sorry, 
combine that with effective PPE um, that you can uh, minimize the risk of infections. And so far across the uh, duration of the pandemic to date, we have had none of the bronchoscopists infected with COVID, despite having conducted a, a large number of bronchoscopies. So it's not a perfect study, but we do think it can be done safely. So to conclude, it is very clear that ventilator associated pneumonia is common amongst patients with COVID-19. It is more common than in patients, similarly ill patients without COVID-19. And that will be for a range of factors, including the duration of ventilation, but also some specific factors going on in the inflamed lungs of patients. It's interesting that I don't think we have seen a significant uptick in rates of ventilator associated pneumonia, even though we have started to use more immunomodulatory drugs. And again, I take Professor Rukuli's point earlier on that steroids are not strictly immunosuppressive, but rather immunomodulatory. But I don't think we can say the same about tocilizumab. And yet, despite that, we are really not seeing a massive uptick in rates of ventilator associated pneumonia. If you have a patient with COVID associated VAP, you could be pretty certain they're going to have the same bugs as they always have in your unit. So be guided by your local flora and fauna. Um, but do watch out for aspergillosis, same as you would in a patient with influenza. Um, we believe in my unit that protected dist distal samples can reduce the risk of overdiagnosis through endotracheal aspirates. Um, and therefore, and we've developed what we believe to be a safe system for doing that. And we, I didn't talk on this on, on a great detail in, in, our, uh, in this talk, but we've used molecular diagnostics to improve both the rule out and rule in of VAP and try to limit the overuse of antibiotics in these patients, because there is a real risk that you treat them all with broad spectrum antibiotics for prolonged periods of time. And that is, again, as uh, Antoine has said, potentially harmful. So that's, that's the end of my talk. Um, I think we're gonna have some questions at the end of the whole session, but if anyone wants to uh, reach out in the meantime or, or afterwards, these are my contact details and I'm happy to be contacted. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew, thank you very much for, for your great talk. Uh, will you stay for uh, the questions? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I, I will move on and I'm going to welcome Professor John Marshall. Uh, Professor Marshall is Professor of Surgery in the University of Toronto, also critical care physician in St. Michael Hospital and senior investigator at the Kinner Research Center uh, of Canada. Also, he's a principal investigator of RIMAP CAP uh, platform study for the management of COVID. And also he participated in WHO. Uh, I would like to thank you, Professor Marshall, for accepting the invitation. It's uh, very early for you in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, it's greatly appreciated that you accepted the invitation and you're gonna talk to us. Thanks so much, uh, Desphine. I hope uh, uh, we are now live. Well, hello, good day, and thanks very much, uh, Desfina. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the symposium. I've really enjoyed the uh, presentations uh, so far. I'm going to conclude the symposium by talking about the management of severe uh, COVID-19 infection. And I wanted just to start with a, the general comment that uh, COVID-19 is not only highly prevalent right now, uh, as we're in the midst of a pandemic, but it comes in a spectrum of severity, ranging from patients who are uh, uh, PCR positive but asymptomatic through to patients who are some of the sickest patients we encounter in the healthcare system. And importantly, treatment efficacy varies by disease severity. And so what I'm going to be focusing on this talk is the most severe patients with uh, COVID-19, those on the WHO severity scale who are uh, hospitalized and receiving oxygen by non-invasive techniques or high flow at the very, very least. 
Uh, a lot of the data I'm going to present to you today comes from a small number of platform trials that have been launched uh, during the pandemic. Uh, certainly one of the uh, sequelae of the pandemic has been the emergence of this as a very effective and efficient model for uh, clinical research. Uh, I'm going to be talking in particular about the recovery trial that has been run in the United Kingdom that studies all hospitalized patients and has recruited more than 45,000 patients, as well as REMAP-CAP, which is a global platform trial whose focus is patients in an intensive care unit. We are now over 10,000 patients in uh, REMAP-CAP. And so this unprecedented level of collaboration and research is generating uh, information at a uh, previously unseen uh, pace. And I want to uh, break the discussion of therapy for COVID-19 into four different groups, antiviral agents, immunoglobulins, biologic response modifiers, and uh, supportive care. So antiviral agents were the first group of compounds to gain uh, prominence in the treatment of COVID-19. And at least initially, there was enthusiasm for the possibility that treatment with an antiviral agent might um, modulate the course of treatment. Unfortunately, this has not proven uh, to stand up. Uh, the early interest was in lopinavir, ritonavir, or Kaletra, uh, and based on some very prominent politicians, hydro hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Uh, the data at the top of the screen here are from the solidarity study led by the World Health Organization uh, that showed, if you look at the bottom line here, really no uh, significant signal for lipinavir ritonavir uh, in, in improving uh, survival. And for hydroxychloroquine, if anything, uh, a slight uh, increase in mortality in treated patients. We studied both these agents on the REMAP uh, platform, and what we found was uh, similar, that the best outcomes were seen in patients who received neither agent. In those who received either lopinavir, ritonavir, or hydroxychloroquine, the outcome was worse. And if you combine the two, there was actually a statistically significant uh, decrement and free of organ support. If they die during that interval, they get minus one and dark red on the graph. If they're completely free of organ system support, they uh, receive blue. And so these graphs quantify severity of illness by the amount of red uh, and conversely recovery and attenuation of disease by the amount of uh, blue on the graph. Um, remdesivir uh, was initially thought to be potentially promising in the treatment of COVID-19, and uh, data uh, from uh, an American study on remdesivir showed that it could shorten the duration of hospitalization. The effect, though, was largely seen in patients uh, who uh, were not particularly sick, and when uh, one looked at those patients who were more sick, those patients who were receiving high-flow oxygen or non-invasive mechanical ventilation the benefits of remdesivir uh, were not uh, apparent. There is a large trial of remdesivir uh, that is part of the WHO solidarity study, uh, which will have more insight into this, but the results are not uh, publicly available yet. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen press releases on molnupiravir, uh, another antiviral agent, uh, and the report that it can uh, affect a 30% reduction in the risk of hospitalization or death in patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. Uh, we've not actually seen these data in the public domain yet, and so uh, I think one has to take this with a bit of a grain of salt. Furthermore, the uh, benefit, if there is a benefit here, is primarily in patients with mild or moderate uh, disease. Nonetheless, uh, this is one that may be uh, the first agent that has some degree of efficacy as a specific antiviral agent uh, for patients with uh, COVID-19, and it's recently been approved by the FDA. Situation with immunoglobulins is also not particularly uh, sorry, not particularly uh, optimistic. Um, there is some evidence that specific 
uh, anti-spike uh, uh, monoclonal antibody, the bamlanivimab uh, combination that Eli Lilly produced, that it can be efficacious in patients with mild uh, disease in present, preventing progression to more uh, severe disease. But I think some of the concerns here are not only that uh, it may not have a role in severe disease, but equally that as uh, variants such as Omicron emerge, uh, the specificity of the monoclonal antibody may render it less uh, potent. We've evaluated convalescent plasma on the REMAP uh, platform, recruiting over uh, 1,000 uh, patients with uh, severe COVID-19 to convalescent plasma or usual care. No signal for benefit overall uh, in patients with, uh, who are treated with convalescent plasma. Uh, no signal for benefit really stratified by baseline mechanical ventilation, although there's perhaps a little bit of a signal on the side of benefit. The only place where there is uh, a potential signal is in patients who had immune deficiency at baseline. Uh, but this is a very small number of patients. It is enough that we are uh, going to continue studying convalescent plasma on the REMAP platform in that cohort of patients with immune deficiency. It's actually in the range of biologic response modifiers that the uh, signal has been the most uh, promising. Uh, we've alluded several times during uh, this session to dexamethasone and the report of the recovery trial in June of 2020, uh, showing a really quite striking reduction in mortality uh, with, uh, patient, with dexamethasone, and that the effect was greatest in those patients receiving invasive mechanical ventilation, where the absolute mortality reduction was about uh, 12%. And so this was not only promising news for treating COVID-19, it was really the first time that we have seen uh, unequivocal definitive results for corticosteroids in treating an inflammatory disease in critically ill patients. The recovery report uh, triggered a uh, cessation of recruitment in remap cap. We were evaluating hydrocortisone as opposed to uh, dexamethasone, but we saw similar evidence of benefit where patients who received uh, hydrocortisone for either the duration of shock or for a fixed dose of seven days had better outcomes uh, than patients who received uh, usual care. And we put together these data uh, with the WHO in a prospective meta-analysis where we pooled data from eight different trials that were evaluating uh, corticosteroids in COVID-19, some published, some unpublished, uh, some published in association with the systematic review. And I think the important message from this is that the signal is robust. We see benefit for corticosteroids uh, across multiple different geographic areas, including uh, South America. And we see it across multiple different steroid preparations. Although fewer patients received hydrocortisone because of the uh, preeminence of the recovery trial in shaping these data, the magnitude of the effect size is similar for hydrocortisone and dexamethasone. So we're really seeing a class effect where uh, corticosteroids are showing benefit uh, for patients with severe COVID-19. We published our results on interleukin-6 uh, receptor antagonists uh, earlier this year uh, from REMAP-CAP. Uh, and in this particular trial, we uh, uh, evaluated both um, tocilizumab and serolimab, two different commercial preparations of an IL-6 receptor antagonist. And what we saw was benefit for either uh, tocilizumab or cerilimab, uh, and an absolute mortality reduction of approximately uh, 5% uh, for treated patients. Again, these data were incorporated into a prospective meta-analysis uh, by the WHO. These data published uh, uh, a few months back in JAMA uh, brought together data from 85% of the trials that have evaluated uh, IL-6 receptor antagonists in COVID-19 and confirmed the findings of both recovery and remap cap that uh, inhibition of IL-6 antagonism is beneficial in uh, COVID-19. It was possible through the technique of both a uh, 
a network meta-analysis and the REMAP-CAP comparison of tocilizumab and cerilumab to compare these two agents. And you can see here that the effect uh, is similar, actually slightly favors cerilumab over tocilizumab, but the uh, sample size is small and the confidence intervals therefore are broader. So again, we have evidence of a class effect for the use of strategies that target interleukin-6 in severe uh, COVID-19. Interleukin-1 receptor antagonist has been evaluated uh, in a number of different platforms. Uh, in REMAP-CAP, our data are under review right now. Uh, these are Kaplan-Meier curves, red being usual care, and you can see that IL-6 receptor antagonist or anakinra uh, does not improve outcomes, whereas the IL-6 uh, receptor antagonists do. Again, data from the uh, French study showed no benefit for interleukin-1 receptor antagonism uh, in COVID-19. There was, however, this trial published in uh, Nature Medicine, Italy, Italy and uh, Greece, that suggested that if you stratified patients based on a marker, uh, in this case, uh, soluble urokinase plus plasminogen receptor, um, you saw benefit for treatment with anakinra. So I think it may be, uh, as in other areas of sepsis, that we have to be more thoughtful in how we stratify patients with uh, disease. Uh, but at least in broad terms, uh, IL-1 RA doesn't seem to be as effic efficacious as uh, IL-6 inhibition. The other strategy that has been evaluated in a number of trials has been in inhibition of Janus kinases. These are intracellular signaling molecules that are involved in transducing signals following uh, interaction of a cell with SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, data from the American Active Study uh, showed uh, benefit for a combination of uh, baricitinib and remdesivir for hospitalized patients. And again, these uh, effects seem to be the greatest in uh, sicker patients. Uh, there was recently uh, reported as a trial of tofacitinib in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia that suggested that this, a separate uh, JAK inhibitor, could improve uh, results here uh, measured as uh, the combined uh, endpoint of death or uh, respiratory failure. So um, JAK inhibitors may have a role to play. I think uh, this is still an open question. Uh, and how, uh, whether they should be used in combination with or as alternatives to uh, IL-6 inhibition is also an open question. Finally, um, therapeutic anticoagulation would seem to be a promising strategy based on the prevalence of thrombotic complications in patients with uh, COVID-19. We tested this in REMAP-CAP and uh, collaborated with two other trials in a multi-platform trial of anticoagulation with heparin, which yielded some very intriguing results. In patients who are critically ill, therapeutic dose anticoagulation does not benefit. Uh, if anything, it, patients are slightly worse off if they receive therapeutic uh, anticoagulation uh, as compared with usual care thromboprophylaxis. We saw the opposite effect in patients with moderate disease where there was a signal for benefit for patients who were anticoagulated with full dose uh, heparin uh, when they had uh, COVID-19. So finally, the mainstay of treatment, I think, for COVID-19 is uh, supportive care. Uh, high flow oxygen has really come into its own during uh, COVID-19. And there are uh, trials such as this one just recently reported showing that high flow oxygen improves outcomes uh, measured as uh, uh, intubation and clinical recovery when compared to uh, conventional uh, oxygen therapy. One of the challenges with high flow is the amount of oxygen required and therefore its utility in uh, resource limited settings. Helmet ventilation has also uh, uh, shown some efficacy. The Hennevant uh, trial showed that in patients who uh, received helmet ventilation compared with patients receiving high flow nasal cannula, there were low, lower rates of uh, progression to intubation and mechanical ventilation.
And finally, prone positioning, and particularly awake prone positioning, has uh, come into its own during the COVID-19 pandemic. There are trials of prone uh, positioning that are beginning to report uh, and seem to suggest that it is another effective strategy. I think it's an area where uh, a lot more work is needed because Clearly, ventilatory support is the mainstay of treatment of severe COVID-19. Understanding how these uh, different uh, interventions interact with each other, which are better, uh, which can be used in combination, how we might use them with differing oxygen target thresholds. All of these are critically important questions and widely applicable uh, throughout the planet. So just to summarize then, for patients who have severe COVID-19 infection, the emerging picture so far from randomized uh, clinical trials are that antivirals have limited to no benefit in severe disease. Similarly, monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma have not shown efficacy in patients with severe disease. We are, for the first time, seeing real promise for pharmacologic agents that uh, target the inflammatory response, uh, corticosteroids, uh, IL-6 receptor antagonists, uh, uh, JAK inhibitors, uh, and there is a, a rich area for further discovery here, but uh, supportive care remains the mainstay of therapy. And if I could just editorialize, I think one of the things we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic is that it is possible to collaborate at global scale and to generate information uh, very rapidly that is really changing the the phenotype of the pandemic and therefore the uh, outcome for patients who've been infected. Thanks uh, very much for your attention today. Professor Marshall, thank you so much for your excellent talk. Thank you. We're going to um, finalize uh, this webinar uh, with the closing remarks. Actually, it will be a highlight uh, for all the talks, and then uh, we're going to have uh, uh, questions and answers. Um, in uh, one minute, uh, we're going to uh, move on uh, with the uh, highlights. We concluding with the highlights, we're going to wrap up with the main messages, a lot of important uh, messages. This is where given today uh, by, our, by our speakers. Uh, Professor Torres uh, spoke about uh, the management of severe CAP. He highlighted that mortality is still unacceptably high, reaching up to 40% in case of shock and mechanical ventilation. The current guidelines recommend combination of beta lactam plus macrolide or quinolone, uh, but uh, an observational data are are uh, in favor of macrolides. Ceftarolin is a quite new uh, cephalosporin active against the and MRSA and can uh, be considered ideal for scap empirical treatment combined with macrolides. Coadjuvant glucocorticosteroid treatment in low dosages and short time of period seems to decrease scap mortality. Then Professor Jan de Waal talked about abdominal sepsis. He gave us an update on epidemiological studies on intra-abdominal infection and the current microbiological uh, flora and pattern of resistance. He emphasized the importance of source control and uh, that there is a shifting intervention like uh, uh, percutaneous uh, drainers. Uh, he mentioned important aspect of uh, antibiotic use in intra-abdominal infection, and also uh, he uh, uh, introduced new therapeutic option in intra-abdominal infections. Dr. Patrick Harris talked about the new antibiotics against the uh, MDR negative uh, bacilli, uh, some already approved, some in development. Uh, many uh, of these uh, novel are combination of beta lactams with beta lactamase inhibitors with specific activities against various classes of beta lactamases. ID physician, pharmacists, and microbiologists will need to be increasingly uh, aware of the me molecular mechanisms underlying resistant EMDR organisms. They are variable, so to choose the most appropriate treatment. And better rapid molecular assays will be needed. Uh, to guide this therapeutic decision. Uh, 
Professor Stefan Hagel uh, talked about Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia. He highlighted that we should always, always take uh, Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia seriously and uh, that proper diagnostic or carbon therapy improves outcomes and can reduce mortality by 50 by 50%. Uh, Professor Chodras talked about, about viral infections in, in the ICU. Uh, viral infection in the ICU have pleomorph presentation, uh, like RDIS, pneumonia, and uh, several other presentations. And we should also watch for the activation of the viral infections. Uh, he emphasized the importance of infection control and transmission prevention, especially for respiratory infections. Although SARS-CoV-2 changed the landscape, we should remain alert for other viruses as well. And he also mentioned that unfortunately we have limited progress for new antivirals. Professor Povoa talked about the, bio, the role of biomarkers in sepsis. Biomarkers are useful in the diagnosis of sepsis, sepsis infection, but we should know its biology, strength and limitations. And also, biomarkers should never be used as a standalone tool, but always in conjunction with a complete clinical evaluation. In the second uh, block of session, Dr. Debus uh, talked about antibiotic escalation. She emphasized that although it's a safe treatment strategy, it is only one of the many components that should be included in an antimicrobial stewardship plan. The effect of different biotic distillation strategies on the microbe of critically ill patients should be considered a research, research priority. Professor Sauten uh, uh, discussed about antimicrobial stewardship with emphasis in COVID era. AMS principles remain relevant as there is impressive overuse of antibiotics in ICU COVID patients. Co-infection in early COVID-19 patients is rare, but they develop bacterial superinfection later in course. Invasive diagnostics are recommended where appropriate. And the role of PCT or other biomarkers is limited in most ICU patients. Dr. Uh, Hafiz uh, talked about uh, therapeutic drug monitoring in the ICU and uh, dose optimization. Although TDM is the safest and effective way to optimize antimicrobial exposure for patients, more robust clinical data are needed to support global clinical practice change. Professor Rokigi uh, discussed uh, uh, and uh, I discussed. Uh, um, uh, immunologic approaches uh, for uh, the uh, therapy in the ICU, even with the best standard of care, approaches based only on antimicrobial therapy fail to cure all the patients. So we need to develop host targeted approaches. It is essential to develop biomarkers and treatment together because host targeted approaches are unlikely to fit with the needs of all patients. Currently, the most frequently described treatment remain the human recombinant interferon gamma in patients with protracted infections. Professor Terpos uh, talked about uh, COVID-19 and the vaccine effectiveness in patients with hematologic malignancies. COVID-19 mortality is high in patients with hematologic mal malignancies other active therapy. Uh, patients with multi myeloma, chronic uh, lymphogenic leukemia, non Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, Waldstrom uh, uh, macrosphalinemia have lower antibody responses, especially if they are under immunotherapy or targeted therapies. T cell responses seem to be reduced in patients who do not develop antibodies against uh, SARS CoV 2 after full vaccination. Dr. Conway Morris. I talked about VAP in COVID patients. VAP is common in ventilated patients with COVID. The organs are mostly the same as we see in non-COVID VAP patients and determined by the unit microbial flora. But aspergillosis is a significant risk and needs to be looked for. Professor, Professor Marshall talked, sorry, uh, talked about uh, the management of severe COVID. Information about effective and ineffective treatment uh, 
has been generated at record pace during the pandemic. To date, the most effective treatments identified are those targeting the host response rather than the viruses. Vaccination and social distancing remain the most effective tools to control the pandemic. Now it's time for questions and the answers from the speakers. We have a question for Dr. Andrew Conway Morris. Uh, Andrew, can you uh, read the question and your answer? Uh, yes, uh, Despoina. So the question came from um, Elan uh, Serfrati in uh, Scotland, who said that uh, they found uh, similar issues with ventilator-associated pneumonia to what we described in Cambridge. The many are gram-negative bacteria, often susceptible to cotrimoxazole, ciprofloxacin, and tazacin, a small number of stenotrophomonas and very few fungi. Interestingly, Elan says they saw uh, more Staph aureus in the first and second waves, but not so much now. And the question was, what antimicrobial do you use empirically for VAP in COVID patients? And what duration of antibiotics do you use for culture negative cases? So that's a really good question, Elan. And I think um, I'd say our empiric choice would be uh, an antibiotic that covers most of the gram negatives, but also provides reasonable gram positive cover. And something like Piperacillin and Tazobactam would be my first choice, or Ciprofloxacin and Vancomycin if they were penicillin allergic. Um, but we would aim to do a bronchoscopy and lavage in the first 24 hours of the patients starting the antibiotics and send for molecular diagnostics to help us uh, rationalize the therapy. If a patient's culture negative, um, then we would tend to continue treatment until we saw a response in inflammatory markers. Now, clearly, patients who've had tocilizumab, you can't use CRP. Um, the data around the use of PCT is, is less clear, but I, again, would be a little bit cautious in, in using uh, PCT in these patients. Um, and so we'd probably end up with a, you know empiric duration of about five days. Um, to seven days, depending on depending on response and, and what we found on culture. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Andy. We have a question from Anna Maria Spanaki uh, for Professor Marshall. Uh, if you would like to comment on urgent therapy for pulmonary embolism. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Um, I don't think there's anything specific to COVID-19 that would change that. I think the uh, choice of options is going to be very much we, what we have available right now and very much dependent on what uh, facilities and resources you have in the institution you're in, uh, ranging from a full anticoagulation to uh, thrombolytic therapy uh, to perhaps even uh, embolectomy either percutaneously or uh, operatively, uh, and again, dependent on the status of the patient. But I think the issue is not one of COVID-19 as much as it is of the uh, hemodynamic consequences of pulmonary embolism. Thank you very much, Professor Marcel. Uh, I cannot see any other question. Is there any question uh, from the speakers that uh, we are attending now to, the, to another speaker that from the panel? Could I perhaps ask Professor Aquili? Um, I noticed, obviously, you talked about fetal, fecal microbial transplant for the treatment of Clostridium difficile. And obviously, we've had a recent trial from the Canadians on probiotics and preventing VAP, which was neutral. Um, what do you think would be the best way of restoring lung microbial health beyond avoiding unnecessary antibiotics? Yes, thank you only for the question. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, a pretty good question because I, basically the idea of performing uh, microbial transplantation is close to the approach is with uh, probiotics. Uh, we can discuss the negative results from these large uh, randomized clinical trials by several uh, ways. Uh, the first one can be the way we are admin injecting the, the, pro the probiotics. If you want to target the respiratory microbiome, perhaps the administration of the microbiome and the probiotic should be better in the uh, endotracheal tubes or at least in the oropharyngeals. Uh, so it's something we should think about. The second point is to probably change the way we are selecting the probiotics. If we think that the idea is not to only bring uh, friends 
common cells, uh, bacteria or fungus. If we want to only restore the respiratory microbiome, the first thing is to define a core of common cell bacteria, which is present in the respiratory microbiome of LC patients and disappearing in, in patients. If we can define this core of microbiome, we can try to develop new prob probiotics composed of this core of bacteria. And we start to have some uh, results for that because some paper published in uh, last year from several uh, groups defined a core of four to five um, uh, groups of bacteria which are present in LC controls and, uh, and are eliminated before ARDS or pneumonia. So probably this is the best uh, probiotics to develop are this bacterial consortium or some of these bacteria. Cheers, great answer. Thank you very much, um, Antoine. Uh, if there is any other question, I will, we're gonna uh, uh, finish uh, this webinar, we're gonna conclude. But before concluding, I would like to thank once more our speakers for the exceptional talks uh, thank you for accepting to participate, knowing that you all have overloaded programs. And um, a, a big thank you. Also, I would like to thank Isaac and the Working Group on Infection, the ICU and Sepsis, for assigning me uh, the role, this role to organize this webinar. Um, and um, also, Fijon Stone, uh, from the executive assistant from uh, Isaac, without her valuable help, this will not be possible. And last but not least, uh, the Delta Communication, also Golbasi for the excellent um, uh, technical support and uh, organizing uh, this uh, webinar. And in the backstage, a, a lot of work was done uh, for everything to, to uh, roll uh, smoothly. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, I hope to see you all, not only virtually, but live sometime. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Despina. Thank you.